Good evening. Welcome to the Town Council meeting of Monday, December 6, 2021, here at 7.01 p.m. in the McKinnon Council Chambers. Agenda item number one, Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Agenda item number two, roll call. Councillor Adams. Present. Councillor Catrona. Present. Councillor Daniel. Present. Councillor Dow. Yes. Councillor Jovan. Present. Councillor Lazo. Present. Councillor Marchetti. Present. Councillor Ryan. Present. And Councillor Steves. Present. Very good. All present. We have a quorum. Agenda item number three, consider and accept the town council meeting minutes of Monday, November 15th, 2021. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Council Steves. Um, one minor thing on item number 19. Um, since it was a roll call, you need to write out the names of the roll call yeses. <coughs> Anything else? Councillor Ryan. Mr. Chair, thank you for you on, excuse me, let me get to the agenda item on the, uh, the parking permit agenda item number 18. I was recused and I did not make the motion. I reviewed the record. It was uh, Councillor Steves and uh, Councillor Gatona. I did not make the motion because I was recused. Right. Okay, anything else? Very good, all those in favor? <laughs> and one abstention. Agenda item number four, subcommittee reports. General Government, Council Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, through you. We have a couple of items on the agenda here tonight and I will discuss them at the time. Very good, thank you. Uh, Department of Public Works, Council Marchetti. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We, we had to cancel the meeting that night, and uh, so all of the items that are on tonight's agenda were sent straight up. Um, we will be scheduling another meeting soon. I know a lot of the members want to talk about the roads in town. I'd like to talk about maybe adding the left turn signals back to Main Street. So we'll be scheduling another meeting soon. Thank you. Very good. Um, Education and Human Services, Councilor Jovan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, no meeting held. We do have a meeting coming up um, December 14th, just prior to the PPP subcommittee meeting um, to discuss one agenda item, which was a grant that we authorized the health department to apply for and they received, so it's the acceptance of the grant. So we'll be talking about that. Thank you. Very good. Planning and development, Councilor Adams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we have not had a meeting since our last town council meeting. Our next scheduled one is this Thursday at 6 o'clock in the Veterans Room. Thank you. Very good. Protection of persons and property, Council Lazo. Yes, we had a meeting and uh, we have recommendations on agenda items 12 through 20 tonight. And we also have a uh, uh, PPP meeting scheduled for the 14th at 7 o'clock in the Veterans Room. Thank you. Very good. WRTA update, <clears throat> Council Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, through you. I'll keep it brief. I just wanted to take a moment to inform everybody that we were able to successfully extend the fare free uh, endeavor we have been on for the last uh, couple of years during COVID till the end of 2022. Um, I want to take a moment. It was a really good meeting. The um, administrator took time before the meeting to listen to all the concerned groups, the Chamber of Commerce, to uh, equity groups, and was recommended, made alterations to his recommendation uh, that day. And the recommendation he gave was to extend fare free until the end of 2022, and to also revisit the fare policy instead of kicking the can every year to keep it fare free, start a real deep dive into whether or not we want to change the policy permanently. Um, that's going to be coming up. We're going to be having those meetings in January and I'll keep the town abreast to that. Um, and that concludes my report, Mr. Chair. Very good. Thank you. 
Agenda item number five, Chairman's announcements. I would like to congratulate Yvonne Tortis on her retirement from working as the executive assistant to the town manager. She also served as a town hearing officer, twice on the Charter Review Committee, and also assisted the EOC during the recent Southbridge State of Emergency. Further, she assisted many council chairpersons and councillors on a daily basis, enabling us to be responsive to the citizens and helping to make Southbridge the great town it is. We wish her good fortune in her future endeavors. Milieu santé et bonne fortune. The Local Historic District Study Committee is holding a public meeting on Wednesday, December 15th, here in the McKinnon Council Chambers. The meeting starts at 7 p.m., and the general public, as well as the members of the various Southbridge boards, committees, and subcommittees are all invited to attend to hear about the results of their work on studying the Central District here in town. I would like to advise my fellow councillors that I hope to address the trash issue at the January 10th meeting, kindly review the presentation materials you have, and direct any questions to Vice Chair Adams, Andy, or Anna. As Council is aware, there was a Charter Review Committee appointed by former Chairperson Jovan, pursuant to the Home Rule Charter, Chapter 12, Section 5-2. I would like to announce that the Charter Review Committee has finished its work. I am asking committee members Denise Clements, Pam LaDuke, and Yvonne Tortoise to come forward to present binders that the committee has put together containing the results of their deliberations. I wish to hold the Council of the Whole meeting next Monday night, December 13th at 7 p.m., to allow the Council and committee members the opportunity to ask and answer questions and generally discuss the findings of the review committee. Ladies. Just to be clear, we are not presenting material to the public. We are not discussing the material tonight. All we are doing is presenting you with a binder that has all our information in it for you to review and to be well prepared when we have our Council of the Whole meeting, in which then we look forward to a really um, great discussion with everybody. Uh, thanks. Come on over here. You can't go away. Um, I'm not quite sure where Ms. Vaughn is, but uh, you, Pamela Duke, myself. Um, and we thank you for giving us this time. We had a little miscommunication. We wanted to be an agenda item um, just to do this, but we figured here, Citizen Forum somewhere, would get the message out to you. Um, we have spent uh, the greater part of just over a year. We had a couple of glitches and, and a few slowdowns missed, uh, with some meetings that we couldn't hold, and uh, we are done. So we have a letter um, that's been, that summarizes, and then we'll talk a, a few minutes just on what's in, what you can expect in that document and then where, you, where we would recommend we go from here. So I'm going to have Pam read the letter so that everybody knows what it says. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman and uh, councillors. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman and council members, the members of the Charter Review Committee are pleased to present its report of charter change recommendations based upon our extensive review of our primary governing document, the Southbridge Home Rule Charter, over the past 12 months. In addition to the recommended charter changes, we hope that our meeting minutes provide council members with useful insight into committee members' general observations and suggestions for other administrative and process changes by way of amendments to the Code of Bylaws and or your town council rules and regulations. The members of the Charter Review Committee have devoted considerable time and effort to researching and analyzing best practices related to Massachusetts municipal government operations from both a general structural and local application standpoint. We believe that our methods, together with the collective experience of our members and the professionals and other town officials with whom we consulted, form a solid basis for our conclusions and recommendations. We would be remiss if we did not take this opportunity to specifically acknowledge the efforts of Yvonne Tortoise during our deliberations. As the de facto committee secretary, Yvonne was responsible for posting agendas, transcribing minutes, and compiling all of the recommended changes into our final report. Her attention to detail and commitment to the process is greatly appreciated. 
It is our hope that you will carefully review the report and supporting documentation contained in this binder, consider our findings and recommendations, and ultimately support the submission of these changes to the state legislature and the voters of the town of Southbridge for final approval and implementation. Respectfully submitted, the Charter Review Committee consisting of Denise Clements, myself, Andrew Murch, um, Mr. David Smick was a former member of our committee, and Yvonne Tordes. Okay. So, um, as you said, you have a binder with, uh, I don't know if you want to go through the binder first before we talk about the next step. So, you have a binder, and um, the first document you will see in it is the Home Rule Charter, and what we've done is um, all of the changes, there are changes in red, there are strikeouts. This is the original, this is the charter, the current charter. Mm -hmm. And it's a path, so you can see all of the changes that we made, deletions, additions, corrections, anything like that. And in blue, we've also um, uh, put the meeting that, at which we voted. So then you can look back after the blue piece of paper into our, those are all of our agendas and all of our minutes, and you can reference those things, and you can see the discussions that we had in the debate um, regarding those changes that we finally voted on to recommend. Um, so that's, that's how this is compiled, your binder. I should uh, strikeouts, but it's all there. We haven't, these are just recommendations that you know coming forward. We haven't officially changed anything. It's either ad additions in red or strikeouts are there that we recommend struck. In. Um, so, now, generally the process, we've been through this once before, uh, the process would, in, our, in this case, my recommendation to the chair was to um, hold a council of the whole meeting so that we could actually discuss and you could ask us direct questions instead of worrying about um, looking at all the minutes, but you can certainly refer to the minutes, they are all there. You can also watch videos, every, I believe every single meeting was videoed, um, so it's out there on YouTube if you ever want to watch our two or three hour discussions of how we kind of came to pass on, on some of the recommendations. Um, and then from there, I've spoken both with um, State Rep Durant and Senator Fatman um, about the process. And generally, it, is, it comes in the form, if indeed, this is something that you think, I mean, there are some basic changes too. There are capitalizations. There's just some fra uh, paragraph structures, things like that. But if you feel that this is something after discussion and after any changes or anything you guys all want to do is something that should go to the voters, then it needs to go first or to the um, legislation, legislators. So it would go up through Senator Fatman first and he would send it through the Senate and then down to the House. And then they, if they agree, it would go on the election uh, ballot for June. Uh, time is sort of of the essence because of the the ba our, our election is now two weeks earlier. It has to be on a, the ballot question has to be done, I believe, in April, perhaps. I, I'm going to double check with Maddie on that. So when you decide, when you've conferred and reviewed and, and made those decisions, um, then a vote in a specific form. So it'll be really important prior to that agenda to making sure that the form of the vote is, is the way it needs to be to go up to the legislators. We can refer back to the previous one we did with the language on that, and we certainly can refer to legal counsel as our as Senator Fatman was saying, we can have legal counsel, municipal legal counsel, look at the, the way we want to send it up as well. You send it up either by specific changes or generally if you just, if the document is kind of a little bit of an overhaulish kind of a thing, you, you know, like I said, you'll understand as you read it, then you'll send it up in that entirety form that you're looking for them to agree to the changes. They may come back and tell us there's a few things they don't agree to or they don't think are legal or whatever and then you can decide what to do there. But if they do agree and everybody comes to a consensus, it goes to the, it goes to the ballot. And then the people ultimately decide whether or not um, they want this to pass. Uh, we, we plan to have it posted on the, in its form now, have it posted as a public document. We've handed it out. We'll post it to the, get it posted to the website. We'll also uh, leave a hard copy with the clerk's office, a hard copy at the library, a hard copy uh, we can do the senior center. We've got about five extra hard copies, so we can make more if we have to. But we plan to make sure the people see the document. And it's not a hard read. It shouldn't take us too long to actually read through it. It'll just be your debates. And so we had requested a council of the whole for next week. I'm not sure if that's still something um, the chairman is uh, is willing to to do or to request or to to do <laughs> to post. And uh, I think that's about it. Um, 
Yeah, so we're not here to discuss content, really. We're just here to tell you exactly what we've given you. And um, I can give you lots of time to, to look it over and then more time before you make a decision on it. Because so, it's an important document. Thank you. Thank you for endearing us with your, with your charter. And um, we really enjoyed Yvonne is here. Thank you, Yvonne, for coming up. And she really did uh, the yeoman's work, as I know the chair likes to refer to it at times. Uh, a lot of typing, a lot of work. So thank you. Thank you for your time this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your hard work. A lot of hard work has gone into this document, and I'm very appreciative of the uh, yeoman's work that's gone into it, really superior work. Uh, and that's all I have for announcements today. Agenda item number six, town manager's announcements. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the council. Thank you. Um, first, I'd like to start off, especially since Ms. Tortoise is here, I want to echo your comments from earlier. Uh, as you know, I've been here 16 months now, and I would not have been able to make the transition into Southbridge um, and work on the accomplishments that we've all worked on without the assistance of Ms. Tortoise. She provided all sorts of institutional knowledge and guidance along the way, um, helped me navigate a lot of difficult uh, situations, and she will be greatly missed by many of the people here. Um, and we are working diligently to try and fill her shoes. Noor El Ghadiri is my new executive assistant. Um, she just started in the last couple of weeks. We had a transition period where Yvonne was kind enough to make sure that I was left in good hands and we're continuing to fill the other positions that are vacant in my office and we look forward to moving forward with a new uh, set of staff and, and the next set of, uh, of team members for Southbridge. Um, one housekeeping item. Ms. Blakely is here this evening. We need to postpone agenda item number 26. We did get some feedback, last minute feedback from Veolia, and we need to uh, evaluate the other proposed um, item that they needed addressed. Uh, I was on the call with Councillor Ryan for the WRTA. It was a good, uh, good discussion and a good vote. Um, staff and I, including Chief Normandin and our new HR uh, Director, Assistant Town Manager, um, Adriana Roviana, we attended uh, Maya training for injured on duty. Uh, we are still continuing to monitor the Delta variant as well as the Om new Omicron variant here in town. We meet every other two weeks, uh, department heads as well as the school in Harrington Hospital. M Mr. Pelletier gave a briefing this morning and noted that our positivity rate is up. Uh, the hospital had indicated that they are at the same level, if not worse than they were almost a year ago at the total of number of patients and that the numbers are just climbing. And I think you can see that on the news, uh, on the nightly news, you see New Hampshire has one of the highest positivity rates. Uh, Mr. Pelletier is working. We're trying to pull staff as well as others in the community to see if we can get the VAX bus to come in for vaccines as well as boosters. Uh, we will be leveraging the website and other forms of media to try and get the word out when those things happen. And with regard to our website, uh, the staff recently participated in some of the training. As you know, one of the goals and objectives is to look at the upgrade of the website. We're hoping between now and next meeting to roll out the new format for the website. There will be a transition period for about 30 days where both websites will be up. We're still continuing to migrate content over from the other website, and I'm sure there'll be a period where people will go on and look, make changes, and they can be submitted to my office. Uh, I'll give an update when we get there at the next meeting. Um, and one uh, brief thing that I wanted to go over this evening, uh, Mr. Marchetti has been asking um, about some updates relative to COVID-19. So I put together a very brief, I know we have a pretty good schedule, a very brief slide presentation, about five or six slides talking about where we are with our COVID-19 funding. So if you'll indulge me for one minute, I'll step over to the podium. It was an email that we shared, uh, actually, Ms. Councilor Marchetti had asked earlier in the week, and I thought it would be good to share it with everybody here. As I indicated earlier this week, uh, Councilor Marchetti had asked if I could get him, with the assistance of Ms. Harnoy's, a quick update on where we are with COVID-19 economic relief. As you know, we get most of our funding from two different sources, the COVID Aid Relief and Economic Security Act, which is known as the CARES Act, as well as the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021, known as ARPA. 
in the email that I provided to Councilor Marchetti with the, that was put together by Ms. Harnoys just goes over the total funds that we've see, received since the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, we will be getting a total of 5.4, excuse me, 5.04 million dollars in ARPA money, but to date they're being released in, they're calling them stanches or stanches. And so far we've received 2.5 million dollars We've received money for, for, through the CARES Act for the ambulance. We've received aid from FEMA for election postage. We've received several um, sets of funding for the airport uh, to the local board of health, CARES Act. Um, and Ms. Harnoy is one to include because it's an important component of what we do in town, what was provided to the school. So to date, we have received $4.4 million in aid um, from the federal government through those two acts. This was something that I showed you earlier this year when we were talking about ARPA planning. This shows that we were receiving the 5.044 million dollars. Part of it was the direct local aid and some of it is from the leftover county um, monies that were given to us and they will flow directly to us. So the funds that we've used to date, just to give you an idea, so far of that $5.044 million, we've used $952,400. Those funds were based on the change order that we did from Main Street. If you recall, we upgraded the water lines going out to several of the commercial properties. And then we did a change order for the reconstruction of Main Street between Goddard and Elm. And then recently we've allocated some money based on our understanding of how we can use money for a qualified census tract for recreation to allow us to move forward with the conceptual design for the rail trip. That leaves us a balance of over four million dollars. And very quickly, when we were here uh, earlier this year, we had met with the staff and I had asked staff at that time in our brainstorming session where they thought the priorities should be. Some of the biggest were to ensure that we had proper uh, biggest areas of uh, where the money should go should be towards broadband, the ambulance, um, proving hotspots, mental health, paving, townwide security. Since that time, I've asked staff to give me actual proposed projects. And here is the total that we have to spend at this point. As I said, we received $5,044,950. We've expended the 952000 so we have a balance of $4,092,550. Recently, I sent out an email request, as I said, to staff. And to date, although it may be a little hard to receive, uh, read from here, these are the, the biggest um, requests that I've received from staff to date. Uh, the first three are the infrastructure. They came back from the DPW. These are there are three separate projects to make infrastructure repairs to the water mains, sidewalks, curbing, drainage, and paving. Um, each one located in different sections of town. Uh, well, East Main Street, Main Street, and West Street. Uh, those comprise the bulk of the $4.3 million. They are approximately $3 million in and of themselves. Economic development, we are allowed to use some of the ARPA, funnies, ARPA monies for uh, local economic development. Ms. Dean has given me these four items that she would like to address. Uh, they deal with marketing and branding of the community, um, looking at instead of having an executive director, potentially a consultant that can be used with ARPA money to come in and work on economic development, and uh, monies for low-income uh, housing for rehab as well as commercial rehab. The community center has also provided some requests to upgrade the doors. Uh, they got significant use while we were running the vaccine um, clinic there. Um, looking at IT upgrades, which would be useful if there's ever another situation such as this pandemic so that we have proper IT, because that is one of our relocation centers if we have you know, continuity of operations. And then looking at making uh, more permanent upgrades to the HVAC system. You'll notice that the total of these um, potential requests is $4.3 million. Um, that's 300000 over our balance. So I just wanted to put this out there. These are the requests that I've received to date, but I think 
It will warrant further discussion and an eventual full presentation with more detail I will give to the council and then we can discuss and vote on which, if any of these, you wish to go forward as well as there are any other uh, particular projects that the council wants to see that isn't on this list. But I just wanted to update you where we are on the funds we've received, the funds we've expended to date, and what staff thinks would be probably the best utilization of the remaining funds. Um, I know we have a lot on the agenda. I'm happy to entertain any questions right now. If not, Council Chairman, we could put this on for another agenda for an in-depth discussion yep. and potential votes. Council Steves. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, one quick question. I don't know if the law allows it, but is it legal to use ARPA or, or CARES funds to, to, um, uh, to put forward the tax rate? Oh, obviously, we're going to be talking tax rate later tonight. Yeah. So, I think I've received a similar question in the past, and my inclination is probably not because you, there are prohibitions on using this for repayment of certain loans mm -hmm. and other federal monies. I, the idea here is to stimulate economic development and directly assist the communities with improving infrastructure. There is quite a large number of FAQs and a rather lengthy interim rule which explains all of the ways you can use this money. I'm happy to revisit that. They are constantly updating the interpretation. We just received the latest one in September, um, and I would imagine we'll get another one in the next month or so. So I, am ha I will go back, Council Steves, and I will look at that. Okay, thanks. Council McKinney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, through you. I did do some research on FAQs, and the question was asked, can my city decrease taxes after receiving these funds? And the answer was the rule that would prohibit tax decreases is restricted only on states. Local government section of the bill contains no prohibition on lowering taxes. Thank you. Okay. I'm not familiar with that. As I said, there's quite a lot of them, and I'd be happy to revisit that and see what we can do. Council Arzo. I would just like to say I'd, <clears throat> I'd like to see a private meeting, not a private, but a uh, separate meeting where we could just deal with these issues and in the structure of this programming. Uh, we have a big agenda tonight, so I just wanted to end it on that. Very good. And that would conclude all of my announcements this evening, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Nice job. Okay, agenda item number seven, presentations, the Board of Assessors, BOA, overview on tax classification and the tax rate by Wilfred Knoyer, Principal Assessor. Um, good evening, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would like to make a request. I'm looking at the agenda, and we are agenda item number seven, nine, 10, and 11, and my presentation and the debate it usually brings about can be kind of lengthy. I would like to request that you move my items or the board's items down after the appointments of the uh, fire, call firefighters and so forth. Um, if, if you don't wish to, it's your prerogative. I just thought, I, I see the families out there and I just don't want to keep them here unduly. So if you moved our agenda items before our agenda item 18, I think that. Okay. Mr. Chair. I move we suspend the rules and amend the agenda as he presented. I second that. Second. All those in favor? Anyone opposed? Very good. We'll move up. Um, agenda item, we have moved to agenda item number 12. Vote to confirm the appointment of Jacob Webb as call firefighter effective immediately through June 30. I'm sorry. Yeah, no. Do citizen swarm first. All right. Okay. My mistake. I apologize to the to the people here. Uh, we have to do citizens form first. I'm sorry, Paul. Okay, citizens form. Are there any citizens that would like to address the council on an agenda on an item that is not on the agenda this evening? Please take the podium. Please state your name and address for the record. Donald Solinsky. Henry Street. My five minutes tonight is about the immorality of your decision to take my partner 
and best friend of 11 years for me because of an emergency situation. Repeat, emergency. I cannot stress that enough. This was an emergency, plain and simple. Now, let me begin by saying that I hope and pray there is a God. I was raised Catholic, and Catholics believe there is one God and three beings. We come to this through faith, and that this faith in God is a gift. It is given by grace, the grace of the Holy Spirit. Now, grace is a favor, the free and undeserving help of God. Well, I prayed for grace, but I never received it until I was given a dog named Vegas. And through the love and loyalty of that animal, I did come to fully believe that all life in this world is special. Not just life of men and women, but the life of all beings. Now, we can argue over the life of insects in comparison to life of, say, gorillas. But when you watch a video or go to a zoo and you look a gorilla in the eyes, and see how they treat one another. Can you tell me there is no soul in that being? Well, the dog, the same thing goes for a dog. And Vegas showed me that. He showed me the love of God. And you took that away from me. You've also taken away the one thing that gave purpose to my life at this point in time. I've never been married. I've never had children. And there are many sad reasons for that all stemming from my own failings as an individual. But Vegas returned both hope and meaning to my life. Again, you robbed me of that. You and that ACO not only sucked the life and spirit out of me, but you did reprehensible damage to the psyche of my dog, Vegas. You should be ashamed that you allowed this to happen without delving into the circumstances. I want to point out the disgust and outrage does not extend to all of you. Ms. Ryan and Mr. Dow are two members that I am extremely thankful to, having supported Vegas and myself in this terrible ordeal. I'm also thankful to Councillor Adams for at least taking the time to try to get to know Vegas a little better. However, I think he was taken in by the sly and crafty ways of the ACO. She smiles and uses her soft speech and mannerisms to convince one that she's on their side, only trying to help or only to enforce the law, she'll say, when really her main purpose is to try to con you in supporting her way of looking at things. This became very personal, and you all, all, you all allowed that to flourish. I think if Mr. Adams had spent time in Vegas alone, you would have at least listened to Mary Lou from ARC, Animal Rescue Concern, when she approached you after the hearing to say she could place Vegas almost immediately in a rescue. But I feel that the ACO had poisoned this council's thinking of the case. She had used information that wasn't true and in some cases an outright lie. For example, she kept trying to paint Vegas as a hostile to the staff at the Oxford Animal Shelter, when in fact Vegas was getting along fine with the staff and had even gotten close to one specific member. This is coming from three separate sources, all at odds with what the ACO reported to the town council. The Vegas that ARC is promoting now is not the Vegas of June 2021, when he was taken from me for choking. He is broken, and you all did that. Imagine, if you will, your dog or cat in the same scenario. Do you think they would be the same after months and months in a kennel? To take someone's emotional support dog away from them just because the dog started to choke and vomit, and then to fight against the person's right to appeal, which I will get into in another one of these five-minute rants that I have. This is immoral to anyone with a heart and soul. Well, I hope you all have a Merry Christmas, and I hope you all get what you deserve. Go Pats.
Thank you. Are there any other citizens that would like to approach the podium to speak on an issue not on the agenda this evening? Um, hi. Uh, wishing you all a good holiday, be it Hanukkah, Solstice, Yule, Christmas, or Kwanzaa, or whatever else there is. Um, for your 2022 New Year's resolution, I encourage everyone to make it local. Eat locally, grown food, shop locally, owned and employed shops, join local politics, and keep your local streets looking nice and safe ecologically. If you are a smoker, make a vow to stop throwing your cigarette butts on the ground. Um, do you know how toxic they are? Cigarette butts are one of the most common forms of litter. 4.5 million cigarette butts, according to a 2011 study, and that's 2011, this is 2021, so think about how many more. And the Ocean Conservancy found that cigarette butts are the most common debris collected among waterways. There are over 4,000 chemicals including formaldehyde, benzene, arsenic, and nicotine in cigarette butts. The study I, I looked at studied the effects of cigarette butt leachate on two types of aquatic fish. When you throw your cigarette butt on the ground, where do you think it goes? Uh, precipitation washes it to the nearest catch basin where, with other trash and litter, washes to brooks and rivers. So please, uh, throw your cigarette butt in the trash or better yet, stop smoking cigarettes. Um, thank you. Are there any other citizens that would like to approach the podium at this time? Very good. Let's move on to agenda item number 12, I believe. Am I going the right place? Yep. Okay. Agenda item number 12. Vote to confirm the appointment of Jacob Webb as call firefighter effective immediately through June 30. 2024 upon successful completion of physical exam and state ethics training. So moved. Second. Council Lazo. Uh, the recommendation was co to confirm unanimously at subcommittee. Before I go further, I'd just like to make a comment, uh, not only to the management of the fire department, but what was impressive was the num number of people that are going into the call. And to add to that, the Brotherhood of Firefighters of Southbridge at the subcommittee level, and even tonight, the gentlemen that are standing here uh, in the background who are firefighters in Southbridge, here to support the call men, is the first great uh, vibration of that they are, uh, they're back, and they're back with a mission at the call level. So I think the management and the fire department itself needs to be commended before we go further. But at this point, this one is a unanimous confirmation. Thank you. Very good. Chief. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's been a long day. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much, counselors. Uh, town manager has reviewed our applications. Obviously, you've got the word from uh, uh, chairman uh, of the PPP, uh, Council Lazo. Um, I do have five candidates here tonight. Um, these candidates have applied. Uh, some of them have applied back in May or, or June. Uh, but due to the COVID restrictions that we had on townwide um, situations going on in our building, plus we had our own COVID situation, uh, we've now got to the point where we're going to put these guys on. Uh, so tonight, uh, the first one up is, uh, is uh, Jake Webb. Uh, Jake currently resides in Southbridge, currently works as a security officer at Har Harrington Memorial Hospital in the uh, reg Registry of Motor Vehicles. Uh, during the hiring process, uh, Jake a, displayed a high degree of integrity, responsibility, and ambition towards being a firefighter and EMT. He does have his EMT certification for a couple months, months now. Uh, he's also uh, gone ahead, uh, obviously, through his security training and done some uh, NIMS training. Uh, that's ICS 100, 200, 700, and is current in the CPR certification. A Corey check has been completed successfully by our Human Resources Department. Uh, I would like to recommend Jake uh, <coughs> Webb to, the, uh, to be appointed as a call firefighter. Very good. Any discussion? Councillor Catrona. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you to the chief. I certainly support the candidates, chief. Just a quick question on, and I missed the PPP meeting. I was away. Um, I noticed the addresses are redacted. I, I didn't know if there was a reason. As I was going through these, I, first thing that I look at is are they all Southbridge residents? <coughs> Um, and as I stated, I, unfortunately, I missed the meeting. But is there a reasoning for that? 
I would probably uh, defer to the town manager. That is the way we've always done redaction on addresses and phone numbers and email addresses when it gets released to the council because it does become a uh, public document. Councilor Adams. So I just wanted to answer that question. I, to the chief, not to counter what the chief is trying to say, but, but the, the specific address is usually redacted, but the town is usually in there. Right. So I think this is something that the chair has already discussed with the uh, front office, though, as well, to, to make sure we put those on there. At least yeah. the town, yes. where I'm getting yes. where you come from. Yes, sir. And, and that does happen Thank in you. the uh, TM's office, the redaction. We get okay. full copies of everything. It was just, as I was reading the documents, it just, it's important to know what town that's all. I just feel so. Thank you. Yeah. Very good. Council Lazo. Mr. Chairman, the, the question was raised at subcommittee about the address because we do have councilors that are, you know, Southbridge first. Mm -hmm. um, so we were kind of baffled by it, the address part. I understand I don't want his social security or his phone number. Uh, but to my knowledge, it was going to be put in for the council meeting. And I think maybe there was a miscommunication, but uh, I thought they were going to be on tonight, and I was kind of surprised I didn't see the address on there that they live in Southridge, but good question. Thank you. We questioned it also. Councilor Dow. Thank you, Mr. Chair. To you, Chief, I want to say thank you for uh, put back the call uh, department life because it's been off for a little while now. So I'm all the way. You can get more guys like them. We'll be, be, we'll be more happy to see young guys volunteer and give something for the town of Southwood. Thank you. Just for, for a point of information, the, uh, the concerns of the, uh, the subcommittee were noted, and I did speak with uh, people in the town manager's office. Um, things, there'll be corrections made, um, but also I'd like to say that um, at the meeting uh, last week that it was stated that um, the candidates were from Southbridge, so that the, the knowledge should get out there, except for with the exception of one. If the exception and, of and one. that will come up in a minute. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Council Jovan. Yeah, Mr. Chairman. Manager, thank uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Through you, just one thing, so I can address it with all the candidates and just say it once. Um, I want to just echo what the other councilors said. Thank you to Chief Norman and Chief, Deputy Chief Hulick and Captain Nichols, especially mm -hmm. for. Um, bringing back the call department, and I brought this up at the subcommittee meeting that um, several years ago when I had the opportunity to serve on PPP, I had asked the former fire chief why we didn't have any call firefighters uh, or it was so small, such a small group, and why weren't we recruiting call firefighters? And he had mentioned that he was requiring all firefighters, all call firefighters to be firefighter one and two before he would appoint them. A, a large group of these individuals, with the exception of one, I believe, Correct. Correct. Uh, don't have firefighter one and two, and the chief is going to send them to training for firefighter one and two. And that was my belief back then. That's how individuals in this town, as long as I've been alive <laughs> in this town, that's how individuals um, joined the fire department, mm -hmm. got trained, and then became the permanent members within the town. So I'd like to thank, uh, echo that, and thank the chief, deputy chief, and Captain Nichols for rebuilding that program so that we have a bench, as you just say, for when future uh, appointments come up, as we know that all towns around us are struggling to find firefighting EMTs, paramedics. So to be able to groom our own individuals on the fire department is kudos to, to them. So I fully supported all these candidates. Thank you. Very good. Further discussion? All those in favor? Anyone opposed? Unanimous of all present. Item number 13, vote to confirm the appointment of Brandon Muller as call firefighter effective immediately through June 30, 2024, upon successful completion of physical exam and state ethics training. So moved. Second. Council Lazo. The recommendation on Brendan Muller was unanimous for confirmation. Very good, Chief. <clears throat> so again, uh, Brandon, he does reside in Southbridge, uh, currently works for Wagner Motors as a part specialist. I renamed that for you. <laughs> During our hiring process, uh, Brandon displayed a good, uh, good character, a high degree of integrity, responsibility, and ambitions towards becoming a firefighter, which all of these candidates fill into that similar role. Um, 
He does have limited fire and EMS knowledge. Uh, as uh, as uh, Councilor Jovan had said, I will say that the, uh, the call volunteer fire academy starts up with two programs in the springtime, which each of these candidates will have a choice to go to either Springfield or Stowe. Um, and then in the fall time, uh, there is another one that will be available for uh, the town of Leicester has one located there for the call vol. So I'm giving these people uh, one year's time to complete those programs because uh, we really need and have to have a firefighter one, two trained uh, uh, firefighters. Um, I recommend uh, uh, Brandon Mueller to be appointed to the call fire department position. Thank you. Discussion? Very well. All those in favor? Anyone opposed? Unanimous of all present. Item number 14, vote to confirm the appointment of Patrick Normandon as call firefighter, effective immediately through June 30, 2024, upon successful completion of physical exam and state ethics so training. Moved. Second. Council Lazo. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Patrick Normandon um, was unanimously voted for confirmation, and I would like each and every councilor to take a look at that resume. This one was a steal. Uh, he is highly qualified and I'm looking forward to see him in the future, as we all talked about, reflect what Councillor Jovan said, creating a feeder system from the call up. This one here is, is a good catch. Thank you. Deputy Chief. Good evening and thank you. Uh, Patrick comes to us from the town of Sturbridge. He lives less than a mile from the town line. He brings uh, Firefighter 1-2 certification, instructor certification, officer certification, uh, as well as being a Massachusetts certified paramedic. Uh, he would need limited uh, orientation training and uh, we can put him right to work. Uh, I've worked with Patrick in the past uh, at another job and uh, enjoyed so very much. He was uh, uh, a good comrade to work with and uh, I highly recommend him for a candidate as a call department. Discussion? All those in favor? Anyone opposed? Unanimous of all present. Thank you. Item number 15, vote to confirm the appointment of Jamie Oban as call firefighter effective immediately through June 30, 2024, <clears throat> upon successful completion of physical exam and state ethics training. So moved. Second. Council Lazo. Jamie Auburn was unanimously confirmed at subcommittee for confirmation of council. Very good, Chief. Uh, so Jamie uh, currently resides in Southbridge and he works uh, for a local landscaping company. Uh, during his hi hiring process, uh, obviously he displayed a high degree of integrity, responsibility, and ambition towards becoming a firefighter EMT. Uh, Jamie also does have very limited fire and EMS knowledge. Um, a quarry check has been completed successfully by Human Resources Department. Uh, I would like to recommend uh, to PPP and also to the council for appointment. Discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Unanimous of all present. Item number 16. Vote to confirm the appointment of Tyler Afton as call firefighter effective immediately through June 30, 2024, upon successful completion of physical exam and state ethics training. So moved. Second. Council Lazo. Tyler Afton was uh, recommended for full confirmation unanimously. Very good, Chief. Uh, Tyler resides in Southbridge and currently works for a landscaping company. Uh, I do have a, a reason for him not being there last week. He was having a medical condition, so we, we excuse him from, uh, from coming last week. Um, during his hiring process, Tyler displayed a high degree of integrity, responsibility, and ambition. Um, he does have some EMT training and also some NIMS training and is uh, currently certified in CPR. Uh, he has limited fire, uh, uh, actually he does have limited fire uh, knowledge, but does have some EMT knowledge. Um, so we'll be working on that with him also. I would like to recommend uh, to council, uh, Tyler Afton. Discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Unanimous of all present. Thank you, councilors. Congratulations, gentlemen. to shaking hands soon someday. Sorry? We'd get back to shaking hands soon someday. Someday. At the end, so. That's right. Feel free. Okay. I guess we're going backwards now. Item number seven. Uh, Mr. Chairman? 
just a quick comment while he's setting up. Um, I got a quick email from somebody saying that the, uh, the YouTube live broadcast is not working. So I don't know if that's still an issue or not. I think the cable one is working. The YouTube, the YouTube isn't. Uh, I don't know if it is or not now. Okay. All right. Someone is. Looks like someone's on it. Okay. <clears throat> Good evening again, uh, members of the council. Um, thank you for allowing us to uh, change positions, although those kids would have really enjoyed the tax pre presentation, I'm sure. Um, so anyway, tonight we're going to be discussing classification in the tax rate. Um, on behalf of the Board of Assessors, myself, Fran Biscay, Diane Kokoska, um, we're going to be presenting information. Later on, you'll be making some votes to do with the, the tax rate and uh, the, the split in tax rate. Um, the, person is, the purpose of classification in the options, Mass General Law allows a shift in uh, the burden paid by the various classes of property. Um, it doesn't change the total tax levy for the town. It simply determines the percent share borne by each class of property. Um, what doesn't it do? It doesn't determine the tax rate. That's all math, which we're going to present. Uh, it doesn't determine how much money can be raised. That's Proposition 2.5 dictates that, and it doesn't determine how much money will be raised. Uh, a series of your votes in the last year on all of the budgets and other money spent, that's what determined what the, uh, what the tax rate will be. Um, topics of discussion tonight, we're going to be talking about a variety of things, new growth, uh, revaluation, which means we, re we, we redo all of the property values every year, um, the tax levy, the tax rate, the levy limit, which means how much money we can raise, our excess levy capacity, we'll be discussing a residential exemption, the classification factors, uh, give some examples of a tax shift, what, what it would actually mean, and then tax-wise, how do we compare to our neighbors and the other towns around. So on new growth, what is it? Well, basically it's new properties that are developed, new subdivisions, new solar fields, new buildings, uh, properties that are taken off of the exempt roles brought into the taxable roles like Wells Junior High, the apartments, and so forth. How does it affect property taxes? Well, it allows the town to raise additional dollars in, to be spent to run the town while only minimally affecting the existing taxpayers. And how does it affect the, the levy limit? It allows the levy limit, uh, the amount of taxes the town can raise, rise by the amount of new growth. Um, so for Southbridge this year, this is a summary of our new growth. You can see we brought in, uh, there's about $5 million in residential value, 273 in commercial value, uh, $1.7 million in industrial value, and $31.8 million in personal property or business equipment. You can see the personal property makes up 81.9% of our new growth, and the vast majority of the new growth uh, dollars that we're raising. Um, and that tip, that is a lot of uh, solar farms, it's also a lot of utilities, um, which we've uh, capturing extra value on this year. So as you can see, this graphically represents the, the CIP, or mainly the personal property, brings up the, the largest portion of this. Uh, our 2022 taxable town value as you can see, the town is worth billion three forty one, and of that, seventy eight point one percent of that is the residential class, and the remaining remaining twenty one point nine percent is commercial, industrial, and personal property. Um, graphically just illustrates it again. The bulk of the town is residential. So this chart here, I, and I know it's rather busy, but I didn't want to cut any of this out. What you see from 2008, where the residential class bore 83.6% of the property tax burden, to this year, where it bears 78.1%, it's kind of like a shift. You can see the, it's a slow slope. In 2008, that's when residential values were at a high from the last building boom. And so they had appreciated to the point where they were picking up 83.6% of the property tax burden. And then, if you all recall, the values, the residential values came down rather sharply, and 
83%, 81%, 79%. So they were falling faster in the commercial industrial personal property class. They were much more stable. Uh, it's not like they were going up, but they were holding their value. So that allowed a natural shift in the taxation, uh, a shift to that commercial industrial personal property class. And I leave that 83.6% on there. Uh, to the left, if I had the other years, you'd see it was very similar to that. Um, just so we can show the trend. In the last two years, last year, uh, the residential class had 78.5%, but this year, mainly because of that growth in uh, personal property, the residential share of the taxes that they're paying has gone down a little bit. Um, okay. So revalu revaluation recertification. Recertification occurs every five years now. It's mandated by the state. It's like an audit of our property values that we have to adjust every year based on the market. But we still have to do, we still have to update our values every year. It's just that the Department of Revenue isn't auditing us. Um, they, we maintain the same standards. We have to do the exact same thing, but they're not coming in and, you know, looking at our numbers, looking at all the ratios. We still do them, but they're just not checking on them annually to the same degree. Full and care, fair cash value, Southbridge, like every city and, st city and town in the state, is required to update the values so that they re represent full and fair cash value on the prior January 1. So the values we're doing right now are as of January 1, 2021. So, okay. um, they're all based on arm's length sales uh, in the prior year or the prior calendar year. And what it really ensures is the taxes are based on your proportional share of the town value. Your value represents a percentage ownership of the town, and that's the percentage tax burden that you pay. Uh, it's all based on full and fair cash value. Uh, and the individual proportions can change from year to year. So in some years, some re residential classes go up really fast because they're really hot. Like this year, it's condominiums. In other years, you can't give them away. So it all changes year to year. Um, the, ways we, the ways we do that is we have a cyclical inspection program, which we're mandated to do by the state. We have to visit our, we have approximately 6,000 properties. We're required to visit them every 10 years. So 6,000 divided by 10. We have to visit about 600 properties a year to inspect them and make sure they're our our data is correct on them. We do a sales review. Any property that sells, we visit, we check it out on the MLS, uh, we, we talk to realtors about them and so forth if they seem a little unusual. So uh, building permits, we go out on every single building permit, we update our records, that's one of the ways we get our new growth, but it also allows our data to be clean and our values to be correct. Uh, recertification, revaluation, field review, in, in the uh, year that we're doing a recertification, we have to go out, uh, we have a contractor that does this because you have to do approximately 50% of all the properties in about six weeks, so you need a lot, a lot of help. Um, and every year we send out annual income and expense questionnaires. Some of you get them if you're business people, and basically we're asking you, what are the rents? What are, you, what are the rents you're getting? What are your expenses? And that's useful in figuring out what a property is worth. Um, we send out forms of list, which are on personal property. We mail them to all of the businesses that have personal property every year, and it allows them to tell us what, what they have for personal property, as well as our own inspections. Um, inspections per taxpayer request, sometimes they'll ask us, and abatement applications. If anybody applies for an abatement, we go and inspect those too. That's how we help ensure the values are correct. Uh, so this year, the valuation changes. Single families were pretty hot. Their values went up about 10.8% over last year. Condos were even hotter. Uh, their values went up about 15.3%. Two and three families, even hotter, particularly the three families, they went up 18%. Um, apartments over four, over four units, last year they went up far more than any other class of property. This year they've uh, settled down a little bit, but based on the sales that we're already seeing next year, they're going to go up considerably again. And the land, it went down 0. 0. 0.7, a li little less than 1%. Um, basically they stayed the same, uh, just a few small types of properties went down. Uh, so the overall residential class went up in value 11.9%. The overall commercial class went down in value, 3.7%, and the overall industrial class went up 
So um, in your packets, I gave information. This is a little bit deceiving. That 3.7% on the commercial, a big part of that is one of our properties went down $5 million. $5 million, $100,000, I believe. So that distorted this a little bit. And one of our industrial properties right next door went up about $5.5 million. So that distorted the overall industrial going up a little bit. But I just wanted to point that out. Uh, let's see. So what this is, uh, this is a report that we have, we submit to the Department of Revenue every year. Um, people ask, how do you come up with these values and how do, what do they really mean? So there's what's called the assessment to sales ratio. Uh, so if a property sold for uh, $82,000 and we're assessing at it, let's go the other way. If the property was assessed at $82,000 and it sold for $100,000, that would be a, an assessment to sales ratio of 82%. And we're required to have them at 95, 90 to 100% we typically try to be at 95% of your, your largest class, and the other classes have to be within 5%. So what, what this really means is, if you see the part where, I've got a little asterisk down there, you see the 101s, which are single families, are at 96%. The 102s, which are condominium, condominiums, are at 95%. Uh, the 103s, small class, I'm not gonna go into that. The 104s, two families, are at 96%. The 105s are at 97%. The 111s, which are apartment buildings, are at 99%. Uh, land is at 96%. And commercial, 97%. We didn't have any valid sales in the uh, industrial, the 400 class. Well, before we started, just based on the appreciate, the, just based on the sales were going up, before we started, the single families were at 85%. Last year, they were at 95% just like this year. But because the sales have gone higher, that ratio went down. And so you have to adjust your values. So that is now at between 90 and 100, and our goal is at 95. So be the single families, before we started, they were at 85%. Uh, after all of our adjustments, they're at 96%, which is full and fair cash value again. Uh, based on that chart you see up there, there were 142 arm's length sales. So that's quite a sampling. Um, I know that concept is a little confusing, and if you have any questions, I'll be glad to go into it, but the condominiums on the second one uh, were at 95%. There were seven arm's length condominium sales, but before we started, because the prices people were paying had gone up so much, that assessment to sale ratio, from, based on the assessments at the end of last year, had fallen to 78%. We had to raise the condominium values up so that they reached the 95%, and you do this on all of the sale properties, and that's, that's how you assure you're at the, right, uh, the correct values there, and then you apply it to the non-sale properties. That, in a nutshell, that's how assessments work. Um, so the tax levy, uh, that the to that's the total amount to be raised is determined by all the voted expenditures, state and county, ch county charges. It's paid for by using state aid, reimbursements, the local receipts, enterprise funds, free cash stabilization, stabilization and transfers. The remainder is the tax levy. So for Southbridge, this year, our tax levy is $24,006,111. Um, so if you take that $24,006,111, you divide it by the total town value, a billion one three forty one. the math of that, that determines the $17.90 tax rate, which is what Southbridge will be. Uh, a comparison, last year, and um, this year we're raising $24,000,000, I forgot a comma there. Twenty-four million six thousand one hundred and eleven dollars. Last year we raised twenty-three million one hundred ninety-six thousand. That's an overall increase of eight hundred nine thousand, or three point four nine percent. However, if you subtract the new growth uh, this year, it's seven hundred and fifty-six thousand five fifteen in additional taxes. Uh, that that really minimizes the impact to any existing taxpayers. So the change after new growth is only fifty-two thousand six ninety or 0.23 percent, a quarter, a quarter of one percent is what the net comes out to. Uh, how does Proposition two and a half affect this? Well, it establishes a levy ceiling, your levy limit, and your maximum allowable levy. And what is ex excess levy capacity? Well, levy ceiling is the maximum amount you could raise. The levy limit and maximum allowable levy. Uh, the top one, levy ceiling. Oh, let me go a little further. 
The levy ceiling states that in any, any year, property taxes can exceed 2.5% of the total assessed value of the town. So tax rate cannot exceed $25 per $1,000 valuation is what it really comes down to. For Southbridge, that means we have to be below $33,528,000, which we obviously are. Um, the levy limit and the maximum allowable levy. So basically what that is, is you take last year's levy limit, you add a 2.5% increase, which you're allowed to do, um, you add your new growth for the year, that equals your levy limit. That's what you can raise. To that, you can include, you can add any additional voter approved debt exclusions and overrides. In Southbridge, it's the Bay Path renovations we did a few years ago. That equals the maximum allowable tax levy. And okay. So for Southbridge, you can see last year's levy limit was 23419 You had the 2.5% increase. You had the new growth that we've already talked about. That means our levy limit is 24761280 To that, you add the, uh, any debt exclusions, which we've already said, Bay Path. So that means our maximum allowable tax levy this year is $24,972,850. Um, so this chart simply says, we have your maximum allowable levy, you have your actual tax levy of the $24,006,000. That means we could have raised an additional $966,739, but chose not to as a town. So that's available for future years. For, we don't, we're not spending it this year, but next year we could, our levy limit, excess levy capacity, will begin at that amount, and to that we'll add next year the new growth and that 2.5%. So it gives us capacity in future years. So options. So there are a couple of things the town can do. You can pass a residential exemption. Uh, you can split the tax rate. Um, what a residential do exemption does, it allows you to shift, up, give a discount of up to 35% of the average residential value to owner-occupied residential properties. To do that, though, the residential class still has to say, pay the same amount, the same share, so the tax rate, rate will increase for residential properties. It would actually be higher than it would be for the commercial. Um, it sh this shifts the burden from lower-valued homes to vacant land to higher-priced homes and non-resident homes. Um, it's not means tested, so somebody who's not a lot of a means, but they might have a large expensive house, um, they, they, it's gonna hurt them. Um, all residential land is taxed at the higher rate, so vacant land will be taxed at the higher rate. Uh, this works in communities with a large amount of vacation homes or non-owner occupied properties to shift the burden onto. Um, the Board of Assessors strongly recommends against adoption of this exemption. Uh, this map right here, and, uh, this is updated as of last year, it shows the communities that have a residential exemption. You can see the purple ones, they're all centralized around Boston and uh, the surrounding communities. You see Provincetown and um, I forget what those other two are, Wellfleet and I think Truro at the end of the Cape. And you see Martha's Vineyard uh, down there as well. Excuse me, not Martha's Vineyard, I think that's Nantucket. Um, what this table here shows, and it's hard to read, I know, um, is the average, if we were to adopt a 10% resident, residential exemption, the yellow line uh, shows that average residential value of $238,000 value. If it was owner-occupied, it would get a savings of $82.51. But if it wasn't owner-occupied, it would actually pay $312 more, okay? It, this is all based on value in the residential class. It doesn't, two family, if the owner lives there, they could get it. Three family, if the owner lives there, they could get it. A four family, if the owner lives there, they could get it, et cetera. Um, the maroon line that's further down shows a value of $300,000, and that's about the break-even point. Any houses below that will pay a little bit less, like at $300,000, they'll get a $1.73 discount per year. Um, but that same house, if it wasn't owner-occupied, would pay $393 more. Um, so this is a very, very difficult process to implement. It takes about a year of, to implement. It's too late for 2022. Um, if it's ever anything you want, you need to study it about a year in advance. Um, it's very labor intensive. Um, okay, pass on that. 
Classification factor, here's where the talk is about shifting the tax rate. So again, Mass General Law, Chapter 4056, requires the council to adopt a factor between one and the minimum residential factor. It allows a maximum shift of 50% to the CIP, commercial, industrial, personal property classes. So based on a our, on our percentage of residential to commercial, the minimum residential factor could be 0 0.8602. If we did that, then the, resident, the commercial class would be shifted 150%. That's the maximum you could do anything in between. Uh, so a factor of 1.0, each class would be taxed at the same rate. So some examples of shift at the various classes. Uh, actually, before I did this, this map here is the, the properties that are in green are the ones that actually have a split tax rate. Um, as you can see, I got, a, I got a, uh, the highways running through it. They're typically communities that do this have a very desirable location, but um, you can see Southbridge in the middle, central Massachusetts. The two properties to the east that, that are in green are Worcester and Auburn. Um, there's nothing to the west of them, central Mass, and, and I forget the, the county to the west of at Hamden County. Um, and then you get to 91, uh, Springfield, Springfield has a split rate, and uh, I think West Springfield, Chicopee, but there's nothing, none of our immediate neighbors do. Um, Webster did have a split rate. Uh, they moved over the last 20 years, and I think they finally got back to a single tax rate in 2019, uh, but it took them 20 years to get there. Little by little, they kept shifting it back. Uh, Sturbridge had a split rate twice on uh, the latest time uh, that was approximately 2010, and they worked towards getting it back to a single tax rate, which they did in 2015. Fitchburg had a split tax rate, and they got back to a single tax rate in 2020. Uh, so this here shows some tax rate shifting scenarios. Um, the bottom where it says examples of the tax, tax rate shift, uh, average single family value, 238,315, and just want to define that again. So that's the total value of all the single family properties divided by the number of them. That's where you get that 238,000. It's called the average. Um, that's how the state does it here, Boston, everywhere else. So that's how we do it. Those are the published numbers that they use. Um, so with a single tax rate of 1790, the average single family property would have a tax bill of 4,265.84. Um, above that, and that's the highlighted yellow line, above that you see all the various uh, examples of a, that same valued property, but at different percentages of the shift. Um, so you can see if we did it the 50%, that would lower the single family bill by $596. But if you go to the two columns to the right of that, it would add 4823 to the average commercial $6,020 to the average industrial. So the average industrial, for example, would go from 12039 to 18059 And the reason for that is, again, this 79%, uh, 78 point, I can't remember the number. There's a large amount of residential property in proportion to the commercial. Um, okay, so again, it, it's the recommendation of the Board of Assessors that the Council approve a factor of one, a single, t a single tax rate. Um, this gives some examples of property taxes this year compared to last year in the various classes. So in that first column, you see condominiums. The average tax bill is going to be $2,059. Last year, it was at $1,933, increase of $126.75. That's a 6.5% increase. But if you recall, and the reason for that, if you recall, the condominiums went up in value at a much higher proportion than all the other classes because they were really hot this year. Uh, the single family, which is really important, uh, the average tax bill, 4265 It's going to go up 2.19% uh, over last year, or $91.23. Uh, two and three families, because again, they were really hot this year. Their values appreciated more than other classes. They're going up about $330, or 8.8%. Uh, land is going down slightly. Uh, over four unit apartment buildings, um, they're going down slightly, 1.92%. Uh, 
the commercial, average commercial, um, it says going down 13.48 or 12.27 percent, but I've explained this a few times and I just really, it's really important. I want to make sure I emphasize it. Below that, it says, please note that there was a shift and reduction of a commercial class parcel in the amount of minus 5,061,000 to an adjacent industrial class parcel, which increased by 5,687. So that large value distorted both of those classes. The average commercial is going down, but not, not 12%. Uh, when you take away $5 million from a, a class that only has 100 properties, it really distorts the average. And the same thing with the industrials. Uh, so again, the Board of Assessors recommends a factor of 1.0, single tax rate for all classes. Um, Tax-wise, how do we compare to our other communities? Well, this here is an illustration of how we compare to the state. The state average this year in the far, in the far right hand column is the average tax bill is 6,148 in Southbridge it's 4,175. Again, just informational, I'm not making any commentary on this. Um, this is how we compare to our neighbors. And some of the towns haven't set their tax rate yet, so we always have to follow this by a year. But Southbridge, our average tax bill last year was 4,175. We were 253 ranking in the lowest. Uh, there were 252 communities that had a higher single family average tax bill. Um, and I think they, in, in this, the state only publishes the top 330 because some of these communities do some things like that residential exemption that I talked about, and it's very difficult to compare to others. So this is 253 out of 330, I believe. Um, I'm sorry, out of 329 this year. Uh, so average, our average tax bill, 4,175. Sturbridge's average tax bill, 5,975, $2,000 more, and they have a CPA, a community president. It's a surtax for Community Preservation Act. Uh, Charlton, 4,348, a couple hundred dollars more than us. Auburn, 5,114, a couple, 1,000 more than us approximately. Uh, Dudley, 3,461, quite a bit less than us. Um, uh, Webster, 4,354, a couple hundred dollars more than us. Um, and Ware, 4,061, a little less than us. Um, so, people who are watching this every year, I make a point of pointing this out because we'll get a bunch of phone calls on what kind of exemptions, what kind of help is out there. So I'd like to take a minute to do this. Tax exemptions and help, uh, there are various exemptions under state law which if you qualify financially or in other ways, you get some money off of your property taxes. This top one is an elderly person or a surviving spouse, it's got a... Uh, financial net worth requirement, but it gives $175 off the property tax. The next one gives $500 off the property tax. There's a net worth and an income uh, requirement on that. Uh, blind exemption, if you're certified blind by the Mass Commission of Blind, you can get $437.50. Um, clause 18 hardship, there are various, but what that really means is it's meant to be a temporary, temporary help to somebody who's got some real dire straits that have happened. Uh, and uh, Let's see, 41A tax deferral. So somebody, if they wanted to, they can defer all of their property tax and sort of in a way like a second mortgage. You don't pay it in the year in question, but when you sell the house or you pass away, uh, the money has to be paid at, and it's at a 5% interest rate. And then there's the senior tax abatement program, which is used in town where you can get up to, not get up to, you can get $600 off your property taxes every year. And that's it. Oh, um, one more thing. After you voted on the agen three agenda items on this, there's a sheet that I'm gonna pass around. If you could all sign the last page of it, it simply uh, certifies that you were presented with the information. Okay, thank you. Very good. Any questions? Council Lazo. Uh, not so much a question. I'd just like to uh, thank Will Kanoya for his years of service. He uh, put him for retirement. Mm -hmm. I wish we would just reject his retirement, keep him, but <laughs> time goes on and uh, he's a good friend of mine. Went to school together, outstanding assessor, 
uh, don't always agree with taxation, but it's mm -hmm. part of life. And uh, the explanation, I've had it explained to me by various assessors, Dean Yacobucci and various other ones, and I will. You did a good job. Thank you for your years of service in the town of Southbridge. Thank you. Uh, and if I have a quick comment as well. So people ask me, how the heck did you ever become an assessor? Um, 34 years ago, there was an, something in the paper about a vacancy on the Board of Assessors. So I thought, yeah, that sounds really glamorous. I'm going to apply. Hmm. Un unfortunately, somebody else had the same idea. And the next thing I know, I'm being interviewed by the town council. That's what the charter says, to fill a vacancy. Just like this, I'm being interviewed. And it's like, all I wanted to do was this volunteer. And oddly enough, the chairman of the town council that night in 1988 was Councillor Lazo. And, uh, it's just funny how it all comes around. Yep. We haven't changed a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Any discussion? Councilor Marchetti. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, through you. Uh, you. In the note below here, and we spoke about this earlier, there was a sh shift in the commercial class parcel, the amount of 5061100 and you mentioned that that was the hotel conference center that re, uh, dropped in value. How does the hotel and conference center, how could that possibly drop in value? Okay, good question. So a hotel conference center is a commercial property like all the other commercial properties in town. It's valued based on the income, on the income approach. So a few things. So a hotel conference center which is a hospitality type business, during a COVID uh, pandemic, is not getting the revenue that it did pre-COVID. It also is tw depreciates every year based on the condition. But the biggest factor is, again, the COVID. Um, I can tell you, Sturbridge lowered their hotels and their restaurants and so forth by 20 and 30 percent, this is what they told me. I haven't looked at any individual properties, but the hospitality, in, because how many conferences were occurring at the Hotel Conference Center last year? Not many, if any. Um, and that's, that's how you do it. You base it on the income value. So conversely, though, on the building next to it, they were doing some improvements on the, not the building, the parcel next to it, which is the, uh, which is the uh, business park. So the hotel conference center went down about 5.1 million. The business park went up about 5.5 million. So I was glad actually, but I, I point that out because it's, it's very important. Shane, it, 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 it distorts the class, those two classes of properties. So that's how it happened. Uh, thank you for explaining that. So I mean, and that to me, if you're telling me that we lost money because of COVID, and that tells me, through you to the town manager, that we should be able to offset some of that loss by using the COVID money. Uh, the, other, the other thing that I'm looking at here, and I, I see it every, every year that you've been doing this, it always seems like the shift of the tax burden is on the residential families. Here it's condos, one family, two and three family. Vacant land has been reduced. Over four unit apartments, somebody can afford that a four-unit apartment, uh, then they must be pretty well off, I would think. Commercial property, that's, you know, big Y, Rite Aid, companies like that, and industrial, and it seems to me that they can afford a tax increase. I know a lot of, every year I say we should consider a split tax rate, and I know some counselors talk about the mom and pop stores, but I, we also have to think about the mom and pop residents who every year, get hit with the most, the biggest burden of these tax increases. This year you've reduced the tax rate, but you managed to, you know, now the, the home values have gone up, so we're still gonna have to pay more. So that, that's, I say that every year, the only way to, to even it out is for a split tax rate. Um, but that's all I have for now, thank you. Anyone else? Council Lazo. Just a quick comment. Uh, I've always voted for a single tax rate when I sat in a council seat. Um, and they say, well, 78% is residential. It was always explained to me by various people, and especially Mr. Kanoya, 
that when you spread the butter on the bread, it's better off spreading it all over the bread instead of just certain portions of that piece of bread. So when I turned around and looked at it that way, and I looked at a slice of bread as a town of Southbridge, and we have to spread it equally, the analogy worked for me to, to stay with a single tax rate. When you look at the map and you see all the green cities and towns, they're usually around some sort of interstate highway, tourism, where there are industrial parks. And if you look at the roadways, they're all around the roadways of, you know, 128, 495. You look as they, they go the Mass Pike West and how the branches of roadways go up, the industrial areas that are built in those areas can afford to take more of the shift where, you know, their in industry is matching their residential. So in my case, I thought if we spread it out equally, you know, the pain is palatable on all fronts. Thank you. I mean, it was up to me. I wouldn't raise taxes at all, but we can't do that. At least I don't think we can. Councilor Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, um, every uh, this will be no surprise to anybody who knows me. I've been pretty consistent on this. Um, I do not support, um, personally, at a personal level, a split tax rate. It, as it's been mentioned by other speakers, it's meant really for cities and places that can, you know, places that are going to be attractions no matter what. You know, it's not communities like Southbridge that are mainly residential. Um, especially this year, though, businesses have been hit hard. Will pointed out perfectly, look at all the income that was lost in these businesses. $5 million from our conference center. Now we want to talk about splitting the rate and increasing their tax bill by thousands, the average tax bill by thousands, while the average homeowner gets an $82 break. It's, it's not a comparable way. And as Council Blazo said, especially right now, everybody's feeling pain. I do not want to put any extra pain on businesses in a, such a delicate business environment when we're trying to expand and grow our business community, not reduce its size. Split tax rates always reduce business size because it makes it much more costly for businesses to do business in their communities. So I would urge, especially this year, a no um, to stick with a single tax rate. Thank you. Anyone else? Council Steves. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, while I understand your argument there, Councilor Ryan, um, and have traditionally supported a single tax rate as well. Um, I'm seriously thinking about doing a split, track, split rate this year um, because of the fact that while you're right that, it, that the COVID situation has hit the businesses, especially the smaller ones, hard, um, it's also hit the homeowners hard. Um, a lot of the people that, especially in our community's demographics, are either downsized or for whatever one reason or another, they're in economic straits that are much more difficult than they were prior to COVID for the same, very same reasons that the businesses are in economic states that are more difficult. What we really need, quite honestly, is we shouldn't be in a situation where we have to decide to pit small businesses against the residents. What we, should, what we need to be doing is getting the money from the people who have the money, the super, the super large businesses, the, the, super, the super large um, income residents or individuals in this country who aren't paying the taxes in the first place and have, are able to afford the lawyers to scam their way out of paying our taxes. We need to be getting the money from those people and the federal government that can, that can share and, may, and make the burden less, uh, make, make the burden more palatable for the smaller, for the smaller communities like ours. Um, one of the things that, I, that that map pointed out is, as you pointed out, is that a lot of the communities that do this are on interstate, which is true. Um, but the ones that I've seen that do, that um, have, have, uh, when, they, when they're doing their tax rates, a lot of the communities, are, the split is pretty similar to ours. They're all more or less the same, 80, 20, plus or minus a percent or two. They're not that far apart, regardless of whether you're here off of a main, main interstate or you're Auburn or Webster. The split is more or less the same. So, that's, so I don't think that that is necessarily a factor in terms of whether we decide to do a split rate. Um, and I was thinking that that would make sense to, to try it and see what difference it makes by splitting it as a 30% split. So I guess, I'll, I guess I'll make that as a motion. Point of order, Mr. Chairman. We are not at the pr pr point of uh, motions. We are at presentation right now, am I not correct? That's correct. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, that'll be a good time. <clears throat>
Council. At the moment. Very good. Council Dow. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you. Uh, we keep saying businesses, businesses. I don't see no businesses in the town of Southbridge. There's only a few of them. And what we're doing, we keep pushing them out. What are we doing for the businesses to come into town or help what is still in town? Nothing. You, businesses, businesses, they need to pay more. They're making more money. I don't see it. You know, for year and year, no business come to town because none of the council or the town support the businesses or helping them to come and uh, open business or, or do anything. Like, I don't understand why we keep attacking businesses. Two, two uh, factory and two uh, grocery stores. That's the whole South Switch. I, I'm, I mean, come on. We need to give the businesses a break to make other businesses come into town, not keep putting pressure on these businesses and they leave. Thank you. Anyone else? Councillor Joe Van. He had his hand up first. He had it first. Councillor Mike Eddy. Uh, thank you. I, I already spoke once, so I would I would defer uh, no, to that's fine. Councillor Joe Van. Decorum, yeah, fine. That's fine. Well, all right. I mean, to to address what Councillor Dow just said, uh, businesses, businesses, businesses. But we've had this single tax rate for 20 years now. So where are all the businesses? We have been giving them a break for 20 straight years. We have had a single tax rate. And yet, it doesn't seem to be working. I will say one thing. I go to Big Y, and I'm not just picking on Big Y. Go to any grocery store around here, and you will see an incredible increase in the cost of food, toilet paper, everything. So if they're not making money, I'll eat my hat. So, thank you. Okay. Councillor Jovan? Yeah. <laughs> Councillor Dow. <laughs> to, to the previous speaker's point, it's economics. There's a crisis going on in this country, and this is not the point of our conversation tonight. Our conversation is what's best for the town of Southbridge and the taxpayers of the town of Southbridge. We have this conversation every single year for four years, mm -hmm. and we always wait till it's tax classification night to have this conversation, and we spend two hours about how we're going to talk about taxes. I tell the council every year, if you want to talk about it, let's talk about it six months ago if we're going to go down this road and what the implications will be to the town. Instead, we spend three hours, have the same conversation, rehash the same stuff, and then at the end of the night, we vote single tax rate. The small mom and pop stores are also our taxpayers. They're also the people that live in the house that are struggling, that have to pay the same taxes that we do. And if we want to have a vibrant town in order to attract businesses and keep businesses here, we have to be equitable. We can have a whole social commentary about liberalism and about who's not paying their fair share. And I, I, th that's fine, that's another conversation. But the, at the bottom line, there are several businessmen in this audience today that have small places that are commercial properties. And when you shift the burden to them, after a year of COVID to Council Ryan's point, we're gonna put them out of business. If we say to Tassie next door, we're gonna increase your commercial rates to the businesses that sat, and I just take that as an example because it's next door, to those businesses that have been there, like Elm Center, who barely survived a COVID year and then say, hey, by the way, I'm sorry, I'm gonna shift the burden to Jeff Tassie, who's now gonna to have to increase his rates, no different than homeowners have to increase their rates to their two, three, four families. He's barely making a margin now because the increase of goods due to economics of this country, that's unfair to them. To Council Ryan's point, Now's not the time to shift a burden to those small businesses. We can talk about big why and all that and, and that, but there are numerous small businesses in the town that really make up a huge, I think, part of our commercial base. They're small, independent individuals. Some are home-based. So that's not fair. Let, if you want to talk fair, let's be fair. Also, do your homework. Go on the Division of Local Services and look at about what we spend in this town compared to other towns. And you'll see we do a pretty good job with the amount of money that we spend for the challenges that we have. We can continue to compare ourselves to other towns about what our tax rate is and everything. 
but they also don't have the similar problems that the town of Selbridge has. So I fully support a single tax rate today, and if you want to study it, then figure out how that impact is going to be to the overall town, economically and socially. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councilor Dow, then Councilor Lazo. I'm all set. Thank you. Council Lazo. <clears throat> I just, I agree with uh, the previous speaker. The thing that you have to take into consideration if you want to talk about businesses is try and be in one. Um, when they turn around and you have a common vit dealer's license, which is the oldest license in America for taverns to serve, uh, to serve food and beverage, and then you have a department, a building inspector department, who starts a restaurant license for $100, then makes it $200 a year later, and the fee keeps going up and up, and don't forget your amusement license. And there are so many fees that you pay beyond this. The liquor licensing authority saw it fit not to charge for a liquor license, $1,000, because we were closed, the, the uh, beverage business. Um, you look around town on, do you want to talk about the American Optical? Yeah, they were giant. They got big pockets, deep pockets. But the thing is, COVID hit these little guys, like the coffee shops and the various pubs around town and restaurants. Um, we're surviving, uh, but then you have other people that just want to regulate you. Well, start thinking about ahead of time, and this is where the previous speaker brings it up, what we spend a year in government to run the town, I mean, that's part of the equation, what it takes to make the wheels turn in the town of Southbridge. You know, we talk about an HR department. Uh, we talk about a reconstruction. The manager is very conservative on his approach on a lot of how to do it. That's the way we have to think as a government. Not just, hey, just tax them and we'll just do it. Uh, regulate them and then punish them. Um, we have people struggling to pay their taxes in business. What, what does the council do five years ago? Eliminate the payment plans. If you don't have it, we don't renew your license. Talk about a foolish thing to do with a pandemic. Uh, so for me, I sit back and I say, this has to be looked at before you get to today. I mean, you'd have to really do some convincing. I have a tremendous amount of experience in business, in government, and I would vote for the single tax rate every shot. Uh, even if I wasn't in business, I would, vote, I would vote the single tax rate. So for myself, and these times make it even worse to go to a split tax rate. I think it's uh, something that, as the previous speaker said, has to be worked on before the night of presentation. And he's right. In 1988 or 1987, 85, it was Dean Yucabucci up here saying the same thing, doing the same job. And it came out the same results. And we had a much, we had a very conservative manager. We had a very conservative council compared to this one. And still, they were, they were on task for a single tax rate. I, I don't think it's good for the town of Southbridge, especially under the COVID um, thing. I mean, you have, you have the hospital coming in saying, go to mass mandate in all businesses. Why don't you just, why don't you just kill them all? Everybody says Southbridge is not business friendly. I think this council, and we're trying to be business friendly, um, I don't know. I mean, I'm not going to uh, go on about it. The only thing I can tell you is a single tax rate is the way to go at this time. Split tax rate's not good for Southbridge. Thank you. Councilor Adams. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for you. Um, I agree. I do think um, a split tax rate is an aggressive tax rate. Um, it's only going to hurt the, some of the individuals out there that we're trying to protect to this day with some grants that are coming through. To previous speakers, I can understand where you're coming from. I do think um, inflation is one thing that we can't control at this point in time, and I don't think businesses are making money off the inflation. Um, but I also bring the back, back the point of policies of the past that have, may have hurt our town a little bit. So um, I do think we are on upward trend. Um, I, one thing that will, it struck me when Will brought this point up, you do a split tax rate. Those individuals that have high-priced homes are getting a huge tax cut. They're the ones who are going to benefit the most from it. Matter of fact, Worcester, Worcester's still trying to get out of their split tax rate issue. They're down eight, I think it was a few years ago, they're down 18% when it came to industry. So I can only see what happens if we decide to all of a sudden and I do a split tax rate without any type of real study for our own town, because one year is not going to cut it. You're talking multiple years. I think we're at a point now where it's, it's, it's growing a little bit here and there. 
Um, I, I do think things are happening. I think with this council, it's, it's been a benefit. Um, I don't want to raise my taxes either, but it is what it is, and I have to um, somehow or another pay for the services within the town that we receive all the time and the good um, productivity that we receive. Um, my worry is that the small mom and pop businesses, just because you own a business doesn't mean you're rich. Just because you own a four, four person home doesn't mean you're rich. A lot of these guys that are owning and gals that are owning these you know, properties are, are, are hopefully basing everything on the rent they receive. And that being said, we raise that rate somehow or another, it's gonna trickle right down to the renters Right now, we have a problem within this country of ours of affordable homes and, and affordable uh, rents. So I think it's just going to hurt us down the road again with the split tax rate. Um, and lastly, um, I wish Will the best in his retirement. Good luck to you, and uh, thank you for your service to the community. Thank you. So I have. Very good. Councilor Catrona. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you and to all the previous speakers, um, I, I, I hear everyone, and we should have talked about this sooner, as a previous speaker stated. Um, I'd like to, over 20% of the town's population is comprised of citizens living below the poverty level. Um, we rank in the 10% level of, um, of one of the poorest communities in Southbridge. So without going on and on, um, I think as the previous speaker, uh, Councilor Lazo, stated at the last meeting, we need to take a look at our schools, mm -hmm. and that will attract businesses, and that will change things in this town of Southbridge. My question to the town manager, before we vote on this tonight, can we look at the COVID money being placed into or utilization of that money for the lowering the tax rate. Mr. Chairman, just through you to um, Council Catrona, uh, I briefly was able to uh, chat with Council Marchetti when they were changing, and I think the website that he referred to uh, where he found that when I Googled the same point came from the National League of Cities, not the federal government. And what the website he was referring to said that there is a prohibition on the states from using that money for tax reduction. It says, but there's no prohibition on the cities and towns. However, the resources I've been using are the ones from the federal government. There has been no guidance provided to date. We're not allowed to use the money for OPEB. We're not allowed to use it for pension reduction. So that's why without anything definitive at the federal government on their FAQs, given that they won't let us spend it for so many other things, I was inclined to believe they're not going to let us. Otherwise, I would think every city and town across the Commonwealth already would have applied that money to reduce Probably. their local tax rate. Probably. And almost every call that I've been on with the administrators and um, managers, we've all been talking about focusing on the infrastructure because the guidance hasn't been clear in a lot of areas. So I'm more than happy to do um, more research. I don't know if I can get, I mean, obviously you have to consider some of this this evening and you, there is a timeline when you have to set the tax rate. I'm sure mm -hmm. Mr. Conori will tell you, I don't know how long you could wait to do any further research, but um, I mean, this would probably be something I would have to refer to our town council to get a tax specialist to look at because they would have to go back and, you know, look at the original um, um, legislation that was put forward. But again, my my gut is where we haven't heard of any other city or town using it, and I can't find any direct guidance on the federal government's websites that uh, I don't think we can. You know, I'm not saying we can't, but I'm just not finding something that says we can. There's, as Mr. Marchetti pointed out, there's no prohibition, but the difference between the CARES money and the ARPA money is up front you would get an indication whether or not you could use the CARES money. They would tell you up or down whether you could use it. Here, we spend it and then we have to go back and reconcile with them and I would always caution that I don't want to be that first town manager that tells you yes and they come back and say no you can't do that and then we find ourselves in a hole trying to pay it back. Thank you for the answer. It was brought up earlier so I at least wanted to throw it out there. Um, thank you. Very good. Council Steves. Um, yeah, through you to the manager. Um, how much do we have in free cash at the moment? Because I know some, we can consider using some of that for this. 
Well, I, I know Ms. Fitzgerald is here. She might have that number. I don't have it off the top of my head. The, the one thing, though, that I would caution people is when you, when you do something like that, if you use these ARPA monies are one-time monies. Right. And there's always been uh, you know, a school of thought that you use those for one-time um, right. projects, such as these large infrastructure projects. I can tell you I was in another community that they, they switched the tax rate they shifted it one way, then they brought it back, and then they shifted it again later. And you know, in one instance, the residents, they saw the, the reduction the first year, but as we all know, costs go up year over year. Mm -hmm. So the very next year, the taxes went back up, and some people were surprised, especially when there was a revaluation in the middle of that. So um, using one-time monies for something like a tax rate reduction, you know, I think you have to give a lot of thought to that before you do that. I think, you know, just my personal opinion, long-term um, return on your investment value, uh, creating public value might be in these infrastructure projects that will last for, you know, decades and, and provide um, services and relief to the residents elsewhere. In, in a way, though, too, think about it when you do that, indirectly you would be reducing um, some of the, the taxes in that we're using that money to do those infrastructure projects that we would otherwise be bonding and putting into the tax rate. So that's true. one way or another, this, this money goes to benefit our taxpayers. Well, I was specifically asking about free cash, though. No, I, I know you yeah, are, but right. I was just a little okay. bit of a side commentary, but I would have to defer to Ms. Harnoy's if she has some idea about the she is here, current free cash numbers. Or maybe even stabilization, considering the whole point yeah. of stabilization is emergencies, and we're kind of in a hole cash, at the moment. So. The free cash has not been certified it has not. for the town. And if you remember, many years back, we built free cash into the budget, and that's yes. probably one of the worst things that you ever want to do. You don't want to, you know, you just want to use it for one, for one time, mm -hmm. like the town manager was, was discussing. What about stabilization? I mean, I know that that, that requires a two-thirds vote, and, and it's a... And I, I, as I recall, we have like three million and something in stabilization, don't we? There's over four million dollars in million. stabilization, but we've worked really hard to build that yeah. up, and that's you know. I'm not. I'm not disagreeing with that. I'm just thinking that, given the situation that we're in, if we were to do one of those two things, that would, that would be a, a way to to lower the tax rates while still treating everybody equally, because you do it across the board rather than having rather than having a split rate. That way, everybody everybody would benefit to some degree. I'm just trying to trying to throw things out, throw, throw, trying to throw ideas out there and think about them a little bit, and see what. And, and, and you're probably right, Councilor Jovan. We probably should have had some a discussion like this a month ago, or something. Um, we did actually have something like this discussed for what, like two cycles ago. We had some extensive discussions at general government that went on for hours, um, where we talked about some of these ideas and. And then we decided not to do anything with them. Mr. Chairman, can, can I just, I, I just needed some clarification here for the purposes of this evening's discussion. We're discussing a tax rate classification, yep. not the budget. The budget was already set. We'd have to go back into the budget to make any changes in the budget. Am I not correct? Mm -hmm. To make any changes to the tax rate. Tonight's discussion is only tax rate classification. That's it. If we want to reduce the budget, you've got to do it at budget time. You can't do it tonight. Tonight's the classification hearing. So can we end his presentation and move to the classification motions? Uh, and I know other people that speak, but I just want clarification on this because I think that's the process. I think we're talking about stuff that we really can't do tonight. It's just a classification here and, and vote the tax rate. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Mr. Nicoy, you've asked to speak. Yeah, a couple of things. Um, so if we don't act upon this tonight, um, which I think we have to and we should, if we don't act upon this tonight, getting the tax rate set and the bills mailed by December 30th, or December 31st, is truly in jeopardy. Um, I'm not going to say it wouldn't ha couldn't happen, but it's truly in jeopardy. And if we don't get the tax bills out, then they're not due 30 days from when you mail them. They're due on May 1st. Okay, so there's cash flow 
considerations. And the reason, the reason we have to decide this tonight is, so tomorrow morning, Karen, myself, will be sending information to the Department of Revenue to get the tax rate certified. We're pretty good at it. It happens pretty quickly. But we need that tax rate to be certified. On Thursday, I'm working with Munis on one factor of this. It's the first time we've ever done it. I had to book somebody several months ago for this. Next Thursday, I'm working with somebody with Munis again to do the tax bills. And these people book out a year in advance. I don't know when we'd get one of these people again or a competent one. So that's why I say the tax, get, if we don't do it now, the tax, getting the tax bill, bills out is truly in jeopardy. I just want to make that clear. And secondly, I want to reiterate to uh, Ms. Heinois's, Ms. Heinois's point. So previously, we did use uh, free cash to lower the tax rate. And five years ago, I took a course on municipal leadership on the, fin the finance presentations, which was, uh, what's his name, uh, uh, Sean Cronin and some others. Th they talked about that's a horrible, uh, horrible way to budget. Um, we've, to Ron and San Angelo and Karen's credit, we got away, we got away from that, which was a real, that's a great financial uh, move in, uh, for the future. I don't really see, you guys can do what you want, this is my last one, but I think that would be a lousy thing to do. It's just not a, it's just not a good financial move. And the third thing is, if you do something to lower the tax, the average tax bill or the tax levy artificially, you do it this year, big amount of money, great. What happens next year? So not only do they get 1%, 2%, 3%, whatever, they get whatever you took away this year artificially, they could hit with that on top of it. So just my opinion, I, think, I don't think those are good financial moves. Thank you. Council Lazo. Yeah, um, a lot of good discussion, probably about the wrong time. Uh, can we not vote it tonight? Absolutely, it's not against the law. We can put it in reverse and, uh, and work on it. And then, uh, when you're worried about your bond rating later and all your other financials, as a, if you treat your town like a business, you have to have your ducks in a row, your budget done by a specific date, your tax rate set by a specific date, and the minute that doesn't happen, it's dysfunctional where you community, the, the, the DOR and everybody starts looking at you saying you have issues. Bottom line is this town hasn't done a hell of a lot of cutting of budgets. You really, you, you really don't experience bad budgets. We've been on a great roll. I remember two and a half went into, uh, went into force. I remember the budgets where, you know, we didn't do our budget on time because we didn't know what the state revenues were. And the state revenues got postponed. Oh, you'll find out in June. Oh, no, in September. We went around the year without a budget. I remember those days. We are a well-oiled machine right now as a community. Uh, you can hand it off and say uh, finance department does a great job. Uh, the town manager, I, pass, I think it's more of a team concept of getting that budget settled. We can have this argument over whether we're, we're paying too much taxation or that. Take it up when you're cutting the budget or adding to the budget or building fire stations or building schools. These are the things that bring your taxes up. Tonight's not the night, as Mr. Joe Van said. It's not the night to talk about free cash. It's a night to set the tax rate. But I'll tell you what, when we swing around to the budget season, that's when you've got to start thinking about what you're doing tonight. So then you work it the rest of the year to see what you want that tax rate to be. Do you want to use extra revenues in other accounts to levy the taxes? We've done that too on the Florence Chandler. We've done it under Jack Howell and various other managers. This is just to set the tax rate. I, I just hope we just let it go, set the tax rate, show fiscal uh, responsibility as a community, then you want to go have, have at it on the budget and, and income and where we're spending our money and staffing. That's a discussion for another day. But today, like Will says, this is his last one. But the thing is, fiscal responsibility is to meet those due dates on budget completion, adoption, set the tax rate. The Department of Revenue gets their paperwork. The bills go out. The wheels keep turning in Southbridge. So for me, I'm done talking on this issue. Let's call it a day on the presentation and move on to the vote. 
Council Adams. I'll be I'm very, sorry. very quick. Council no, Adams. I don't support anything superficially lowering the tax rate. We've gone down that road once before. It failed miserably. Second, I'd like to move on with this yeah. meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Okay. Are we all set? We pretty much said what we need to say. Very good. Let's move on. Agenda item number nine, a vote to establish a tax classification factor of 1.0 for tax purposes. The Board of Assessors recommends a yes vote for a single tax rate. So moved. Second. I think we're discussed out. <laughs> Very good. Roll call vote. Councillor Adams. Yes. Councillor Catrona. Yes. Councillor Daniel. Yes. Councillor Dow. Yes. Councillor Jovan. Yes. Councillor Lazo. Yes. Councillor Marchetti. No. Councillor Ryan. Yes. And Councillor Steves? No. I believe that's 7 2. Yep. Motion passes. <clears throat> Item number 10 vote to adopt varied classifications of property for tax purposes, including open space discount and residential exemption. The Board of Assessors recommends a no vote. Moved for discussion. Very good. Second. Very good. Roll call vote. Councillor Adams? Yes. All right. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> I threw my form a loop over there. Usually it starts the next letter over. <laughs> this is <one's> confusing. <laughs> Councillor Catrona? No. Councillor Daniel? No. <laughs> Councillor Dow? No. Councillor Jovan? No. Councillor Lazo? No. Councillor Marchetti? No. Councillor Ryan? No. And Councillor Steves? No. That's 9 0. Motion. That's not good. <laughs> Motion doesn't pass, right? It's a no vote. There were nine no votes. Okay. Um, agenda item number 11 vote to adopt a single tax rate for all classes of property. The Board <laughs> of Assessors recommends a yes vote. So moved. Second. Roll call vote. Councillor Adams? Yes. Councillor Catrona? Yes. Councilor Daniel? Yes. Councilor Dow? Yes. Councilor Jovan? Yes. Councilor Lazo? Yes. Councilor Marchetti? No. Councilor Ryan? Yes. And Councilor Steves? No. I believe that's 7 2. Motion passes. Very good. move on to agenda item number 17. Vote to confirm the appointment of John Brackett to the Southbridge Airport Commission effective immediately through June 30, 2024. State ethics in good standing. So moved. Second. Second. Very good. Any discussion? <clears throat> Council Mike Heddy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I didn't get any uh, paperwork on this appointment, reappointment. And uh, I thought we had, general government had passed a new town council rule that all appointments would go through the subcommittee. I believe that's correct. Um, I was asked to move this forward. Uh, and at the time, I felt it was appropriate to do so. Um, but I'm willing to listen to the council's pleasure. Councilor Adams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, I, that was the same question I had this morning. Uh, we did vote on that on November 1st, I believe it was. So thank you, uh, Councilor Ryan, for listening to me for a few minutes on that issue. Um, I, I, I don't want to hold up the progress of this, but this will be the last time I vote on this subject, on this idea or this, uh, this type of agenda item, unless the two chairs of the subcommittee and the uh, town council uh, agree mutually on, on it, moving straight forward to the town council. Uh, we think we've uh, beat this to, to a pulp and it's still popping up. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone else? What? Council Steves. Um, if, since we didn't see it at subcommittee, um, I'll bust it through you to the manager. Have you had a chance to talk to, talk to Mr. Brackett or the airport commission? Can you tell us anything about this person? What he's done on the commission so far, if he's being reappointed? Through you, Mr. Chairman, no, I have not. I typically have called all 
in most cases, or every case that I get a brand new appointee that I haven't met. In this case, I did not um, see this paperwork. So, no, I have not spoken, Mr. Brack. Council Jove. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, through you. Um, I know Mr. Brackett. I've known him my entire life. Um, he was a, uh, in the Air Force, and he was, was a Southbridge firefighter, a long line of firefighters in the town of Southbridge. I know he works very hard up at the airport. I've had many conversations with him about the airport through just general conversations. He's always up there mowing. He's doing other work up there. Mm -hmm. uh, we do not have people banging down the doors for airport commission. That's true. Um, I do concede that these should go to a subcommittee as you wish, but mm -hmm. I, I see no reason not to reappoint uh, John Brackett. He, he is qualified for the position. He has served for a number of years um, and does a lot of work up there with the rest of the airport commission. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Council Oslo. I, too, uh, know John Brackett. Uh, grew up with him. Uh, coached his family and Pop Warner. Very um, good relationship with the family, uh, bound to the fire department. I do agree with Council Adams. Uh, this is a reappointment, though. This isn't uh, somebody that, that's, um, that's new. Uh, so when you do a reappointment, um, yeah, I think we should have, you know, uh, something in front of us for the people that don't know John Brackett uh, to find out, you know, what type of person he is. But the thing is, as a volunteer, as a person with Dallas Albert, I think he's a standout guy, and I think he would meet the criteria. But again, if we start a process as a council, uh, and I know there are some things that go to my subcommittee that don't waste my time at subcommittee. It's an automatic. I know we've talked about this. Mm -hmm. I'm the chairman of the subcommittee, and, and the, we push it forward for a reason. And the reason would be that the, that the time frame on a grant uh, or mm -hmm. the appointment, because training's going to start. There are reasons why we push it oh, no. to the council. Uh, I'm not sure there's a reason on this one, but I'm going to vote for John Brackett because I do know him, and I'm fortunate to know him. Thank you. Councilor Dow. Thank you, Mr. Chair. To you, uh, I agree with uh, Council uh, Marcari regarding the thing coming up in here before we see it or we know about it or pass down in uh, uh, the meeting. We have mm -hmm. some time, uh, but I'm going to excuse. <laughs> Sorry for tonight because I know John. I used to be with him on the fire department. He's a very great guy. Uh, doesn't mean we have to break all the rules, but like. Councillor Laza say it's a reappointment, so we already know who he is, and we, I don't think we should delay it and uh, bring it back. We should vote for it and, and keep moving forward, but hopefully in the future that doesn't happen again. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Councillor Marchetti. Wait. If, you, if your word for this person is, is good enough for me, I'm just making a point that we pass a law, we pass a rule, it gets in our, in our rule books, it's in the town, or we, sometimes we have things that are in the town charter, we just seem to ignore it. Now we got something that we recently passed to put it on the town council rules, and now we're going to ignore it. So how about it? Your word is good enough for me. I'm sure he's a uh, very qualified, fine Thank person you. to put on the committee. I don't have a problem supporting him. I'm kind of curious of what uh, general government uh, sub, uh, chairperson has to say. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, through you. Um, I had, uh, um, I'm going to be honest, I had no notification that this had happened, that this, it, I was never notified about posting this on my agenda. Mm -hmm. um, however, mistakes happen. And, you know, I, I try to be very, um, people oriented, things happen, people are we're having transition in office staff, things happen. Let this be an example of we did just pass a rule, please don't let this happen again because next time I may not be as gracious. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Very good. All those in favor? Anyone opposed? Unanimous of all present. Item number 18, vote to accept the fiscal year 21 emergency management performance grant, EMPG, in the amount of $5,980 and to authorize the town manager, manager to sign all related documents. So move. Second. Uh, what have I got here? Councillor Wazel. Yes, 
This went to subcommittee and it was voted unanimously for confirmation. Chief. Uh, <clears throat> good, good evening again. Uh, obviously, this is a, uh, grants are what we uh, build a lot of our fire department on. Uh, this is a repeat grant uh, that we've, been, we've put in for again. Uh, this is the 2021 Emergency Management Performance Grant. Uh, this year's uh, uh, funding is $5,980. Uh, this is a matching grant. We do pay for our Everbridge uh, system for the townwide alerting uh, system. So that is, that, that is the uh, share portion of it. Uh, this year's uh, requests are for ballistic vests and helmets, uh, additional trauma bags um, with um, uh, clot uh, uh, gauze and uh, tourniquets, uh, some sharps containers that we use for our townwide uh, community uh, sharps crusher. Um, I, I hope that you all had a chance to look at my memo and along with the associated grant. I, I hope that you could appoint this and make this move forward. Thank you. Very good. Discussion? Council Marchetti. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, through you. I did, I did discuss this at the subcommittee level. Um, I'm not opposed to the grant. I think it's, um, I've always liked grants, especially a grant like this, that we don't have to put forward extra funds. You've already figured out a way to match something that we're already spending money on, so that was a wise uh, use of that to match this fund. I did question the use of it only because I thought, you know, uh, to buy, uh, well, they look like World War II helmets and uh, bulletproof vests for the EMTs. I, I didn't really, I didn't think it was a good use of the grant. I know that you brought up Newtown and I'm sure everybody's got Detroit on their mind, what happened last week. Um, but Southbridge isn't Newtown and Southbridge isn't Detroit. So I just don't see something like that happening here. If it did, I suppose it could happen. I suppose it could happen. So I'm not naive to think that it could never happen. Um, but why, why would, I don't know why you would send EMTs in first. For one thing, I don't think, like I said, I'm not opposed to the grant. I just kind of was questioning the use. I also watched the fire station building committee meeting that Councillor Jovan is the chair of. And uh, I, uh, I know that there was a lot of equipment that was mentioned at the meeting. I think there was a representative of KBA who said he wanted to do a walk-in because there was a lot of equipment, pieces of equipment which may or not, may not have been incorporated. He wasn't aware of it. I would think you'd want to spend more, get more grants to fund that fire station, try and keep the cost down on that fire station. Uh, but, you know, like I said, I'll support the grant, just was questioning the use, that's all. Thank you. <clears throat> Councilor Adams, then Councilor Joe. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I will I just a <laughs> correction. These Kevlar helmets, they're probably only more, no more than the design itself, probably 20 years old or something like that. But they, they're, still, they're still utilized. They now use mostly the, what they call the Mitch helmet, which is a little different, just a little history on that one. But um, <laughs> it's a sad state that we actually have to ask the firefighters and EMTs to come in with flak jackets and, and helmets. I mean, a lot of cities actually go to this because of the thing, and you're right, we're not some of these other cities that happened to, but obviously uh, preparing for the worst. Unfortunately, we prepare for the worst, um, hoping it never happens. So we, we you know, I, I, kudos to the fire department for doing it. Uh, I know I've talked to Chief uh, Woodson about the Kevlar vest and all that kind of stuff and how, how does that work for them so they could properly rotate it out because they go bad after a period of time. Um, I'm sure these bulletproof vests do at the same time, whatever's, uh, uh, instituted inside of them, um, but uh, I, I appreciate the chief and, and uh, uh, everybody else that uh, looking forward uh, to uh, uh, properly plan for a worst case scenario. Uh, and uh, thank goodness there was a grant out there that uh, could help offset some of that cost or take care of that cost for us. But I would say again, you know, back in uh, the the LA riots that happened, um, it, it wasn't it, it wasn't a pretty place to be. And I know we're not Los Angeles nor the size, or but. You know, it could happen anywhere, uh, and uh, I just appreciate you guys being prepared, and, and we just ask you to do more with less. It's the way it works sometimes in the <coughs> service community field. Thank, Thank you. you. Council Joe, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, through you. 
I certainly appreciate Council Marchetti's comments about um, his concerns that, hey, Selbridge is not like other towns. But that's the point. We don't know where this may happen. So Newtown, little community on the, uh, in Connecticut, you know, ha has this tragedy. We explained, and I said through my personal experience as a police chief for over almost 15 years, currently serving on a college campus, small college campus, we all have to prepare for the, for the worst. The way that people respond to incidents, and this was brought up at the meeting, is totally different than what it was 20 years ago. 20 years ago, you would never thought that if you had an active shooter case, that you would have to wait for everybody to get there, get SWAT in, they'd all go in. Now it's, if I'm the first policeman there, I'm the first one in the door. Those EMTs come, as soon as I clear, we're getting victims out and those EMTs have to go in. The dynamics has certainly changed. So I certainly appreciate those comments. We don't want that to happen anywhere. Certainly not. To the comments about the fire station. We are actively, just for the public, we're actively searching for any grant that we can. If we could have used this grant for the fire station, we would have applied for it. The comment about extra new or new and additional equipment was the chief went out, got a grant for, to destroy shops and needles and all that. That's because there's an opioid epidemic in this country People need a space to get rid of these needles. It's in the fire station. That was something that came up. And when we talked about, just for the public, when we first did the audit on the building and what we would need, that was done in 2019. Right? Maybe even a little bit earlier than that. 18. 18. Three years later, well, three years ago, we had a tiller truck that we all know what happened with that. We have a new ladder truck. We now have to tell the architect, new piece of equipment, that's what we're talking about, new piece of equipment, different configuration. We also talked about, so those type of things go into a firehouse. We're not talking about building it any bigger. We're just saying, we're doing due diligence on the fire station. What do you have now? Make sure it goes into that station. Don't forget about it. Because as everybody says, accountability and oversight. Have project oversight. Council Controller says it all the time, and I don't disagree. We now have an owner's project manager that's going through that project to make sure that we account for every piece of equipment. So I just want to bring that up because it was brought up. I know it's not on the agenda, but that's the reason why. So times have changed. Great that they're going for grants to protect firefighters in our worst moments. Thank you. Councilor Dow. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Excuse for you. I just got a question. I have a, maybe came to me, a, mistake or maybe not. Invoice, and if you turn it, you get the grant 5871.67, but it's added 128.64, the, the amount will be 6,000. I just want to make sure that clear, uh, we void it only on the 5871.67 or on the whole amount. There is no question in the future. So the uh, total grant is 6031 um, that we actually purchased things to go towards the cost of the uh, grant that we're going to be receiving. If you go to this, the uh, page description of activity and expense, Everbridge was $5,871 and some change. We didn't have the matching, 100% of the matching. So we had to add in shops containers for community shops crusher, crusher to get over that 59.80. So we're gonna vote for the 6,031 right now, or just for the 5,871.67? 5, 5,871. Okay. Uh, 5,980. 5, 5, 5, yeah, 5. 5,980. Yeah. Yep. As the. Uh, That's the matching. Okay. okay. Thank you. There's three different numbers here. I just want to yeah. make sure we vote on them. That's very good. good. Council Laswell. Yeah. Um, the discussion of the, the equipment, back to the original point of the grant, we're an evolving society. I, I know that the previous speaker, one of the previous speakers, I served with uh, on school committee, as an evolving 
uh, society, nobody thought we'd have a police officer in a school building. Nobody ever thought we'd have cameras on our doors in lockdowns. Um, and the reason why we do this is to be proactive so it doesn't happen like the other communities. You try and be on your A-game. Uh, as far as a firefighter uh, wearing a bulletproof vest, doesn't surprise me nowadays. Absolutely not. Uh, a helmet, whether it is a helmet to go in on a, a shooting or a helmet going in on a fire, it is equipment needed to deal with both sides. We are an evolving uh, society, and some of the things we're not happy about evolving, but you're better off being proactive about it. And Southbridge has always been kind of out, out front with a lot of this stuff, thanks to the, uh, the management of both uh, public safety facilities. As far as the new fire department, give it time, we'll get there. Thank you. Anyone else? Very good. All those in favor? Anyone opposed? <coughs> Unanimous of all present. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you, Chief. Item number 19, vote to accept Massachusetts Interlocal Insurance Association, MIIA, grant to replace exercise equipment at the police department and for standing desks at the town hall in the amount of $13,823.54 and authorize the town manager to sign all related documents. So moved. Second. Council Lazo. The recommendation of subcommittee was unanimous to pass. Very good, Chief. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the council, Mr. Town Manager, thanks for having me tonight. Uh, this grant originally started with the, at the town hall. I was asked if we would um, take it over and complete it, and all that they asked for was a few stand-up desks. We said that's a win-win for us. This equipment originally went into our building in 1997. This grant essentially pays to replace most of it. Okay. Any discussion? Councilor Mike Eddy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, through you. Um, the question I have is the, the grant level tiers says that for a certain amount of subscribers, you get a certain amount of money. So you're getting 13, you're, it's going to cost 13825 but are we only covered for 70, no, I take it. 7,500, so does that mean that we're going to be paying an additional amount for this, or? No, negative, through you, Mr. Chair, the grant was up to $15,000 for the amount of people that we have in our community. So, oh, so we, it's the we amount of people? Okay. 13,000 and some change. All right, thank you. Yep. I thought it was the amount of people that'll be using no, it. No. All right, thank you. Could mm -hmm. counselors come in there and use it? Because I, I could use some, some exercise. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I think the chief and I have had this discussion. <laughs> Anyone else? Very good. All those in favor? Opposed? Unanimous of all present. <clears throat> Item number 20. Vote to accept the fiscal year 22 Body Worn Cameras Grant Program in the amount of $55,780 and authorize the town manager to sign all related documents. So moved. Second. Council Lazo. Recommendation of subcommittee was favorable to pass. Thank you, Chief. Just quickly, uh, we're willing to subject our offices to constant recording, and that's a good faith effort, in my opinion, of being transparent with the people that live in our community. Uh, during the completion of this grant, we conducted a survey on social media. 85% of the people that live here were in support of this initiative. The use of body cameras increases the accountability of our offices, of the people that we police. It's the best way to show the public how we actually interact with our citizens every single day. It helps build more trust than we already have because I believe we have a lot of it. And it helps reduce the time that it takes in investigating internal affairs uh, matters. Uh, it's going to be done in phases if this is approved tonight. The first phase is here I am requesting that this be approved. The town manager would sign that contract. It gets sent back to the state. Acceptance of the grant, it simply means that we have the intention of implementing a program. The second and the third phases would be me working with the union to implement this body camera program that works for all of us and then the purchase of the equipment once that agreement's made. During that phase, we'd also uh, start doing demonstrations in the community. We'd post on social media just so the community is aware of what we're doing, why we're doing it, how we're doing it, and when it's going to be done. Phase four would be to train our staff in the use of the cameras. And phase five would be when it's active. This grant ends on October 31st, 2022, so in future budgets, you'll have me in front of you I mentioned this at subcommittee asking for it's about $15,000 per year to maintain after the initial setup. 
I, I personally think it is absolute money well spent. Not only that, but my, or I'm working right now with them, I, I think we're going to get back about $10,000 on our insurance policy if offices have body cameras. So the 15000 about, give or take, that I'll be asking for during every budget cycle going forward, if this is all approved and in place, we get about 10000 of that back on the other side with the Maya policy. Um, the grant, we have about six, well, not about, we have six months from the time the town manager signs it, it goes back to the state. When the state representative signs it and sends it back to our community, whatever they date, we have six months from that point on to implement this program. So with that said, I'll keep you informed as we move forward. If it doesn't end up happening, the money goes back to the state. If it ends up happening, we have a great program and a great initiative for many, many years to come in our community. Very good. Uh, Council Lazo. Yeah, um, again, I'd like to just take a moment to commend the chief on being proactive. This is what I was talking about. Who would ever think that your police officers would have cameras on their chest 35 years ago, 20 years ago? Um, in the town of Southbridge. But again, alleviating liability helps on the insurance front. Uh, and it gets rid of the he said, she said, uh, no, that happened. Um, well, with the camera, you just hit the button and the eye in the sky don't lie. Thank you. Councilor Dow. Thank you, Mr. Chair, to you, Chief. Uh, thank you for uh, working hard to have that done. Uh, hopefully, uh, will be complete. I know you're going to be working too on uh, the way they're going to be used on all the time or when they're out of the cruisers. Uh, if I could, for you, Mr. Chair, every single time we have an interaction with a citizen, it's going to be on. Going to be on. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That's very, very good uh, move for the town of Southbridge. And uh, like the chief say, uh, we will have more trust from the citizen and the police to be able to communicate together and have more trust and working together as a community and a safety public. Thank you. Very good. Councilor Steves. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you, you mentioned that the, uh, there'll be about 15 grand a year afterward. Does that include replacing cameras? Or how long, how long did these cameras last? No, it does not. This, the initial setup is, is uh, for 38 body cameras, everybody mm -hmm. including me. And then what happens is as the life expectancy, five years, I'm hoping, but we'll replace gradually. We're not going to do all 38 again. Mm -hmm. The most expensive component of all this is actually the storage mm -hmm. because every, every, every shift, eight-hour shifts, four, five, six offices on a shift, it, everything gets downloaded after every shift. Mm -hmm. So the data storage is pretty ridiculous. Uh, quite it is, totally. yeah. so, so that's that's a big chunk of this. The initial purchase is a big chunk of it. The training, when mm -hmm. they come down and train us how to do it all. Charging stations, similar to our portable radios, mm -hmm. all these have have to be charged every shift. So the startup cost is pretty pretty big. Is this data storage going to be at the police station or online or in the, in in the, the cloud? cloud? Or It's in the cloud. Um, and as far as people access, if, if, if events happen, how does the public know where to get this video? They'll be able to, through you, Mr. Chair, they'll be able to file a uh, information request mm -hmm. like they would if they wanted an accident report, mm -hmm. if they wanted body camera footage. It's public record. Okay. okay thank you. Very good. Councilor Ryan. Thank you. Just, I just kind of want to go off that a little bit because it got me thinking. So would this, for the public's information, be something that's stored permanently within the police department, or is there a time limit in which um, video information would be deleted? Like, you know, most businesses usually after five, ten years transition all those records out to make up for the, make the storage back. So yeah. I wanted to know what, what the policy would be for the department to hold on to all these videos. I believe right now we're working on a policy where it will be stored for a year. And if there's no incidents, it just overwrites itself. But there's also camera storage, and we're working with a vendor on this still. Some rewrite every 30 days, some do every 90 days. But we'd like to ultimately get that to a year with the technology that's out there. But again, this is a lot of data. But if there's no incidents that are reported within 30 days, I feel comfortable where we can rewrite that data. Because 30 days after you have an initial interaction with a police officer is, is, is a long time. If something serious happened. Or any arrest, anything like that would be st stored much longer. But just the everyday interactions that we have, if there's no f complaint lodged or no issue or no reason for us to save that, it would be rewritten. Okay. But in an arrest situation, a car stop, things like that, we would save longer. I'll be interested in seeing what that policy yeah. looks like after it's developed. You'll see it. <laughs> <laughs> Council Steves. If I can follow up on that, too. Um, just double check with uh, what state law says, because I know that's a whole bunch of of state uh, public record storage laws out there that can be really ridiculous in some cases. 
Um, so I, I don't know if they cover this kind of thing at all. Because this is all new, I know with yeah. typical OF, it's an incident report or an accident report. If mm -hmm. there's no issue, it's a year. You okay. can get rid of it. Okay. So we'll see what they decide with the body cameras. Right. Okay. Anyone else? Councilor Marchetti. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, through you. Uh, I have a couple questions and maybe a comment or two. Uh, there's different uh, total amounts in here, and I'm, I'm just trying to get it straight. Uh, the grant is for 55780 The cost is 66630 is that correct? Mm -hmm. So there would be 11000 We would have to chip in 11000 Am I reading that right? Well, the amount we're looking for is a 55,780. I know there's a cost difference. I believe it's like a little over $11,000. Okay. The cost for the startup of the grant is equipment only, and we're, we're going to work with a vendor about the storage and the software. All right. So what we need to start the program, to build the program, to get them out on the street initially would be the 55,780. And then I got to figure out how we're storing data, what vendor we're using, how many licenses we need. But to get this moving, and I don't believe I'll have to come back until when we start discussing budgets for FY for July 1st, 2022. I think we'll be okay with this original number to start the program. All right. I don't think I know. I, we'll, we'll be fine until July 1st. I'm also kind of curious as to who wrote this narrative for this. Lieutenant Belrose. Who? Lieutenant Steve Belrose. He's a second shift lieutenant. He wrote the narrative. All right. I notice... I noticed down at the bottom here, it says, the department maintains a strong commitment to the community policing philosophy and draws guidance from the president's task force on 21st century policing. The pillars noted in the task force report provide a roadmap of best practices for success in building agency legitimacy, relationship of trust, and the community and high levels of police service. These have long been the goals of the department. Uh, the President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing was created by President Obama. And under that program, there were several pillars. One was building trust and legitimacy. Uh, there was another one on technology and social media, which is what you're doing tonight. There was another one on policy and oversight, and the recommendation was some form of civilian oversight of law enforcement. So do you, do you support that? No, not in this community. You don't support nope. that part of it? Okay. But you do support the President's task force, right? I don't support it 100%, no. I don't support Pre President Obama at all, if you want to know my political opinion. But I do support some of his objectives. All right. Okay, well, uh, the rest of the narrative I thought was kind of like, kind of a downer, really, <laughs> when you look at it. It's like, I didn't know Southbridge was that... Was that a, I don't know, poorest city even Massachusetts? Um, you know, sometimes you got to look at some of the positive things about Southbridge. There's a, there's a lot of success in town, you know, not just, I, I'm not saying we turn our backs on the underprivileged, but um, we also have to respect success in town and uh, have some pride in Southbridge. So I, I was just kind of like, looking at this narrative and wondering, is this what Southbridge is like? Because I don't feel it's that way, but um, okay. But that's all I have for if now. I could, Mr. Uh, if I could speak to just that part of it. The, pro the issue with the grants are they're looking for that type of data, why your community is in need of a grant. This is a very competitive grant. So I don't know a lot of the things that, you're right, it does depict Southbridge as a, as a bad community. I don't believe that at all. It's just one of those things with these grants, any type of grant. It's a good question, valid point. Uh, state, state grants, federal grants, we have to describe the community in ways where uh, we can compete with other communities. More wealthy communities couldn't put this in. They wouldn't get this kind of funding because they're not in need of the funding as much as we are. So I agree with your point taken on that. All right. Thank you. I'm all set. Thank you. Councilor Jove. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say one of the successes I've I truly feel is our police department and our public safety. I've said it time and time again, our police department is truly representative of the community when it goes to the makeup of our community um, through the diversity that the police chief has in, in the department. Um, I fully support body cameras. Back 20 years ago when the community policing grants came out for cameras and cruisers, 
I put those in my cruises because they do protect the officer and they protect the community. Um, we, our police officers have great interactions with our community, but there are some incidents. Um, you know, we have a very busy police department. And yes, and I know writing those grants, it's tough because you do have to portray some of the things of what the need is, but Council Katrona pointed out earlier, 20% of our community is in poverty. We can't hide from that. That's what our community is. And we're looking for these grants because eventually the state will say, you need to have body cameras in, in, on your police officers. And the chief's uh, being proactive to get that, and that's how you get those grants. So um, we do have a lot of great things in the community, uh, but there are some, some troubling things. And uh, we, as a council, are working to accentuate the positive while knowing what some of the shortcomings are. But uh, let's move on. Thank you. Councilor Dow. Thank you, Mr. Chair. To you, Chief, two questions. It's going to be on the auxiliary police, too, as well, when this? That's a very good question. There, there will be no more auxiliary police as of July 1st. By the time this program is implemented, due to the police reform bill, we will be losing the auxiliaries. So it will be just full-time police officers. The second question. If everything will vote yesterday and everything go through the grant, when we can see them on the police officer? <laughs> We have, again, six months from the time of when this is signed, so I would say if it's signed within the next few weeks, I'm hoping by summer. We only have till June. If it doesn't work out, I'll be reporting back to the council, explaining why it didn't work out, and we'll have to try another avenue. Hopefully I come to you way before, before that. Thank and you. Talk. And I just don't want to give you a hard date, but it has to be by June. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Very good. Okay. There being no further discussion, all those in favor? Anyone opposed? Unanimous of all present. Thank you. Thank you. Good job, Chief. <clears throat> Item number 21, vote to approve the school department request to declare the 1999 Ford F-350 as surplus. So moved. Second. Second. Councilor Jovan. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman, through you to the rest of the council. This did not come out to EHS because we've already declared it as surplus and it was just transferred to um, another department. So we had already declared it surplus, so this is just to dispose of it however the town sees fit. So that's why I didn't call just a meeting to have this agenda item. So I would just add that, uh, vote, uh, recommend a friendly amendment if I could, and recommend the town manager dispose of according to best practices. Very good. Did you get that, Mary? Yep. Great. Okay. And for the record, Mr. Chairman, typically what we do, Ms. Farron, um, as you know, did leave the employment of Southbridge. Uh, we're still waiting to get an additional um, clerk in the office, but typically with these things, there are several online auction sites, mm -hmm. and we have used, I've used one in the past. We have an account on one. Um, this will be put out there, and more often than not, somebody will buy it. If it's still drivable, they'll fix it. If it's parts, they'll take it. So something like this will go relatively quick. Very good. Uh, Council Lazo. So this truck's going to go to an auction site? More often than not, if we have no other use internally, typically we try and find a use for it. Um, but if not, most of our vehicles, I know the chief has someone that usually comes in and buys them. My experience in other towns and some of our other equipment we put on online auction sites. Okay, because I'm very familiar with this truck. It was uh, up for discussion earlier. It's one that would go to the auction would be in pretty good money. Mm -hmm. No matter what anybody says about that truck, you know, I think, I think it would be uh, good for the town to make some money on it. Thank you. Anyone else? Council Mike Eddy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lincoln. Chairman. Is there something wrong with the truck? Uh, we transferred it over to the school department because they had a need for it. And at the time, uh, I believe when it went to the school department, it was, I'll let Heather answer it, but um, it went to the school department because they were waiting on their new trucks that the town council had authorized them, well, had, uh, they had bought through capital, and then they kept it at the schools as a spare vehicle. So I don't know if they don't have a need for it anymore or what, but. Uh, um, the vehicle has been down at my yard for the past year, or at least. Um, I know that is true. It transferred from the fire department to the school department while they were waiting. They did a little work to get it operational again. Um, it stopped working. They decided not to fix it again and stored it there at my facility. 
uh, until they decided whether they were going to get rid of it or not. So it has been non-operational at my facility for over a year. And I, I can't tell you what's wrong with it because they haven't asked us to look at it. They right. repair their own vehicles. No, but thank you. That, I mean, that was my question. What's wrong yeah. with it? It's just not working. Right. Not a very good answer. <laughs> Councilor Dow. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So you, uh, vehicle not being used will be uh, uh, more uh, risky for a lot of parts to go bad. Uh, so if we have a chance to sell it and get uh, $50, if you park for 20 days, 30 days, you get $20. My second question is the town manager, are you going to post it on the town website when that truck is going to go in the auction? To the residents or the people know about auction for the town of South Beach, all the equipment is going to be sold. A lot of different towns do that. When you online, Facebook, they see that. Why we don't do that as well in the town of South Beach? Thank you. When I was in charge of it in one of my prior communities, that was my policy. Um, now that we have new people coming in, um, we're going to be looking at everything we've done, so it shouldn't be a problem. Typically, you post on your website, you put something on a bulletin board downstairs near the clerk saying that you're going to have this and you include the website that you're going to use. Um, there are people that scour these municipal website, auction websites daily, you know, looking for these types of things. So there'll be people that are interested, but yes, we can put it on the, uh, the website under the news when we go to do it. Thank you. That will give more a chance for the the residents to know what's going on or when that truck was sold or they have a chance to bid on it if they really need it. Thank you. Anyone else? Very good. All those in favor? Anyone opposed? Unanimous of all present. <laughs> Item number 22, vote to adopt the proposed Town of Southridge Federal Grant Policy and Procedures Manual to establish written policies as required and authorize the town manager to sign all related documents. So moved. Second. Councilor Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It was recommended unanimously through the subcommittee. Um, Karen actually did a quite a great um, presentation on it, so. Any questions? Any discussion? Council Steves. With a quick observation. As I recall from the, from the meeting, didn't Karen tell us to take off that section about having the, the manager sign all related documents since this isn't really, we're not actually approving any grants, we're just approving the policy for the, the grants. Yeah, there you go. <clears throat> Move up to the mic. If I recall correctly. And yeah, she's nodding over there. Okay. That's correct, Council Steves. I tried to get that corrected, but they, they left on there to authorize the town manager to sign our related documents. That can be struck off of there. Yeah. It would yeah. just be as required. Right. Just okay. as required? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. I'll take that as a friendly amendment. Mm -hmm. I'll accept it. Mary, did you get that? Yep. Okay. Very good. Any other discussion? All those in favor? No one opposed? Unanimous of all present. Item number 23. Vote to ratify the payment in lieu of taxes pilot agreement between the town of Southridge and Consolidated Edison Clean Energy Business for the assessment of taxes for personal property located at 0 Clements Hill Road, parcel 017-001, dash zero 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 one and authorize the town manager to sign the agreement and all related documents. So I move. Second. Uh, Councilor Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, um, this was recommended by the subcommittee unanimously. Um, this is quite technical and Will went into great detail, so I would like it if you presented a little bit of a brief. <coughs> I'm sorry, is there a question or do you want me to explain? Just, just a brief summarization of it for the entire council. Okay, um, so that, that parcel mentioned, uh, the developer is gonna build a 2.3 megawatt uh, solar producing facility there. They received their permits and all their approvals from the planning board about two years ago. Um, COVID delayed it all and uh, they tell me they're gonna start construction in the spring, somewhere around March, I think, or pre-spring. 
Um, this pilot is more of a valuation agreement. Uh, it just decide, it fixes the uh, assessed values and depreciation schedules on all of the equipment over a 20-year period. Um, I, in my opinion, it's fair to both the town and to the developer. But my opinion, it, my, my concern is the town and it's fair to the town. Any other questions? Councilor Marchetti. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, through you. Uh, this land that the solar farm is going to be going on, that's 21 acres, correct? Uh, I'm not sure exactly. I, I, I don't know. Um, so this, the solar farm is in lieu of taxes. Could you repeat The this? solar farm is in lieu of taxes, right? No, the, it, the, it's called the pilot payment in lieu of taxes. Uh, which is a little bit of a misnomer, misnomer. That's what they're called, but they're more of a valuation agree agreement over the 20 years. The, these taxes are for the personal property only, the equipment only. They're not for the real estate. The real estate will be taxed additionally. Well, how much would the taxes be on the, pro on the personal property if we didn't agree to this? They'd be similar to what the pilot is, but they would be contentious. Uh, this fixes, fixes it for both the town and the uh, developer. When I say similar, the, uh, there's always a question about uh, it's, it's high-tech equipment, it's depreciating faster than the town is, uh, is allowing for it. So the valuation would, in some cases, the valuation would be lower. Um, so it, it's similar. And in fact, the legislation here that's referenced on the front says that the uh, Valuation has to be similar to full and fair cash value. Again, it just it allows stability for both parties. Mm -hmm. um, the twenty-seven thousand six hundred per year. Thought that's the payments, but that's to be determined. Correct? We no, don't that's know fixed, that. Right? But we don't know that's what it's going to be according to that. The paperwork it says to be determined. Oh, okay, I see your point. I thought you were referencing in future future years. Uh, it's to be determined, but um, the developer has approvals for that amount of uh, uh, DC nameplate wattage. That's their goal to maximize every cent of it, every, uh, every bit of it. If it goes any higher than that, the, re the revenues will increase. If it goes lower than that, the revenues would decrease. Um, I really don't see why they would go any lower, though, because if they're approved for that, they're going to try to maximize their, uh, their income for their project. Right. Okay. So the land there right now is worth, according to the, your, your website, is worth 244200 Now, there's solar panels up on Dresser Hill Road. How much is the land up there worth? Um, typically, typically, it's about $50,000 per acre with three to five acres per megawatt, typically. Um, more efficient use of it would be a little bit less land, less land at that higher value, um, but typically that's what it would be. Well, I was looking at some of the, the lots up there on Dresser, off Dresser Hill Road, and some of them are worth, one's almost worth a million dollars. Is that correct? It is correct, but that's a huge facility. I forget how many megawatts, but six or seven might But it's be. about the same acreage, no? About 21 acres, I think. Yeah, but it's not just the acreage. Um, so it's the land, the prime site, which is what the solar panels would be on, and then everything else is called excess land at a much, much lower rate. Right, okay. So do you think the land up there on, on uh, Clements Hill Road, do you think that that will increase in value and that, and that would be tax? Yeah, it will increase in, it probably will increase in value. Um, I haven't analyzed it. Um, your question here. I recall in 2016 or 2017 when the owner at that time took it out of, uh, it was in chapter 61A and he took it out, he let the, he just elected not to continue it, so he didn't really take it out, he just discontinued the uh, applying for it. And when he did, he indicated it was going to be commercial space, commercial land, not, no, not solar way back then. Um, so it was converted to, uh, and back then, if you recall, the uh, Casella stuff was still going on, and there were other uses they were trying, were considering doing. So I've, I expect it to go up, yes, based on the use. So the land will still be taxable, but not the, 
not the solar panels. Uh, well, no, in different ways. So the land okay. will be taxable. I think I explained it at the subcommittee meeting. But the personal meeting. property will not be, right? Correct? But the personal property will not be taxable? Yeah, as I said, the land will be taxable uh, uh, and the, the solar property. The, the reference on the front page of this is to new legislation that passed, uh, I think it was in March of this year, and it's, it, what it does, it treats differently how you have to tax these. It may, it probably will, we're still, you know, there's still clarification. It may go to page three of the recap, which is miscellaneous non-recurring as opposed to being in the tax in the tax rate. We still need to clarify that a little bit with the new legislation that passed. All again, right. Again, um, it's technical and I'm sorry. I, it's, it's, it's technical and uh, that's what our attorney said. Okay. Uh, 20 years is a long time. We, we have no idea what's going to happen 20 years from now. But um, the, o the only problem that I have with this is the fact that it's a solar solar farm up on a piece of land and we've had problems up on Dresser Hill with the runoff. So just want to make sure that before we agree to anything up there that we have some commitment that there'll be steps taken to prevent the runoff as, as we've had on Dresser Hill. Thank you. Anyone else? Gus? I'm sorry, Council Steves. No I'm just a quick comment to that. I agree with what Mike just said. And I just want to point out that this is something that, that I think we've kind of thrown around the idea of doing something. I think we really need to seriously consider a moratorium on more soil developments. I know Council Lazo mentioned it at the subcommittee. Um, I know we tried it, we threw it around at GenGov briefly, and then unfortunately I got sick and I couldn't attend that meeting. Um, but it's something I think we need to seriously consider. This is a project that got approved a few years ago, so I'll certainly support the fact that the town will get paid for it. But if this were coming up as a separate project, it's not a project I would approve now. Council so. Lazo. Since it was mentioned, I know at subcommittee I brought up that I would suggest a moratorium for a year or two to bring up a discussion on the future of uh, solar panels in the town of Southbridge because they haven't worked out quite the way we thought they would. Thank you. Anyone else? Very well. All those in favor? Can I request a roll call because it is a pilot? Certainly. Roll call, Mary. Councilor Catrona? No. Councilor Daniel? Yes. Councilor Dow? No. Councilor Jovan? Yes. Councilor Lazo? No. Councilor Marchetti? No. Councillor Ryan? Yes. Councillor Steves? Yes. And Councillor Adams? Yes. I have 5 4. Yep. Very good. The motion passes. Item number 24 vote to approve a transfer of $163.50 from account number 600 440 120 Maintenance operating to account number 600-440-543100 operations for the increase in annual contract operation over budgeted amount for fiscal year 2022. The budget was based on a 4% increase. Actual increase was 4.02% based on the Consumer Price Index for Urban Consumers, CPIU, from September 2020 to September 2021. So moved. Second. Uh, Councillor Marchetti. Oh, the meeting was canceled, so it came straight up to the council. Very good. Heather, please. Ms. Blakely. Yes, thank you, Councillor Marchetti, for considering moving these directly to council. Um, as some of you know, I was sick last week, so I wasn't able to be at the meeting that was scheduled. So. Um, I think this is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, the wastewater treatment plant contract has a clause in it that is adjusted annually in September. Um, well, based on the September index, which doesn't actually come out until like November. We have received those adjustment calculations and we budgeted at 4% knowing that the CPIU was going up, but it actually was 4.02. So we we're very close. So we just needed the extra hundred and I don't even know the number off the top of my head anymore. 163.50 to cover that extra 0.02%. And it's just coming out of the existing budget. We're just taking money out of one line item and putting it into the other. 
Very good. Councillor Dow. Thank you, Mr. Chair. To you. So, question for uh, Councillor Marchetti. Uh, you always write on everything, but how come you move that uh, agenda? <clears throat> didn't go to sub community either if she's sick, why you don't reschedule it? She was sick. You still have to go. Uh, this is the way you want it, correct? Everything before you come here, I have to Counselor go to sub community. Well, Counselor I was Dow. just trying Counselor to be. Dow. I was just trying to be, uh, you know, accommodated. If she wasn't going to be there to answer her questions, we did have some other issues about roads that we needed to ask questions on. So I thought it was best that we. I hope you're feeling better too, by the way. I was I kind am. of concerned there. I, I, I was quite sick, negative COVID, but quite that uh, there's a nasty cold going around, so I will but can I, can let I, everybody I, know yeah, that there trust is me. a bad no, I understand what, I'm going to continue. I understand what you're saying. Okay, uh, Councilor Dow, you may Thank you, Mr. McCarty. That's nice of you, what you did for us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Very good. Any I further have, discussion? I have one question. Uh, Councilor McCarty. I know it's not very much money, but I just was kind of uh, wondering, when, we, when you did this contract, I remember you saying that it was CPIU U. was 5%. No, mm -hmm. it's, it's a range, so the contract has a range in it that there's a minimum of 2% of and a maximum of 5%. So it's based on actual CPIU rates that, you, that are published by the federal government from Boston. So they come out a couple months after. So we have to make an assumption, you know, for the budgets that we're doing and make, start making assumptions in basically January, about what the CPIU is going to be nine months from now, uh, from then. So we have to make a, a guess, obviously, of what it's going to be at that time. I did know costs were going up, so we guessed 4%. The actual cost came in at 4.02, so we have to make that adjustment. I would expect that next year, I will probably be putting in the max, just because I know what's going on with the CPIU to be safe. Um, but it's, you know, we have to, we have to know what, what we're up against right now. So we, we're going to have to look at what the rates are doing at that time and, uh, and go from there. But we do have a min and a max. So even if it's below, I will say historically, we've, all, we've been very much at that 2% range um, since I've been here. And this is the first time I've seen it really go up to that range. All right. Thank you. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Anyone opposed? Unanimous of all present. Item number 25, vote to approve the summary table for 2020-2021 winter equipment hire for snow plowing and snow removal with the addition of PRP construction. So moved. Second. Uh, Heather? Um, so this is the second time you're seeing this table. I did say at the first time that we probably would come back with additional vendors. We did receive one more additional bid. Um, Piapi Construction has been a regular snow plower since <clears throat> I started nine, uh, 10 years ago. So I kind of expected to get his bid. Um, so now we have included it. You can see he puts in multiple pieces of equipment. I do think at this point we are actually relatively well set up for this new year. We have had a couple people apply for the temporary snow plow driver um, positions internally also. Um, Water Department is set to provide services again with their, some of their staff. The school department, at least one employee, has indicated that they will also assist. And as you can see, although we have a way asked to um, temporarily hold the Veolia contract, they, we are also negotiating with them to be able to provide services similar to the water department to provide additional snow plowers that way. So we'll probably be better set up this year than we were even last year. Um, we're already one more truck on for vendors, for outside vendors, and we should have available staff, additional available staff than we did last year, so. Very good. Any questions? Councillor Catrona. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a quick comment. Mm. Um, and I'll, I certainly mm. will vote for this this evening, but Come budget season, maybe we can take lessons from a gentleman like this that has equipment when we buy new vehicles for 47 years, 41-year-old vehicles, and he's still running them. 
um, today and running them hard too. Uh, maybe we can take lessons on, the, on how we maintain our equipment. Thank you. Anyone else? Very well. All those in favor? Anyone opposed? Unanimous of all present. Mr. Tom Manager, I believe you asked to postpone number 26. Yes, that was the um, Veolia contract that Ms. Blakely was referring to about getting them to do some of the plowing over at the water department. So we just have to talk with them and adjust one or two things in the, the document that was there and should be here um, for the next council meeting. Very good. Mr. Chairman, do you want it postponed indefinitely or to a specific date? To the next meeting on the 20th. We should be set by then. Next meeting. I'll make a motion to postpone until next meeting. Second. second. Very good. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Marchetti. Council Marchetti. Um, when, you, when you bring this contract back, you might want to change it to the town of Southbridge. It says the town of Sturbridge. So oh, it's the wrong contract. <laughs> <laughs> wrong town. It, it, was, it was their draft contract for yeah. Sturbridge. So. Thank you. <laughs> Any further discussion? <clears throat> Very well. All those in favor? Unanimous of all present. Very good. Council's forum. Uh, let's start over here. Councilor Dow. I want to say thank you for uh, Mr. Will served in the town of Southbridge, and they did a great job, uh, the least when I'm here. <laughs> and, and to Yvonne, I think, I don't know if she came up already or, or she's coming up, and Kim as well, and good luck with their uh, future life. And thank you. Good night. Very good. Council Lazo. Yeah, I too um, spoke earlier on Will Canoy's retirement. Uh, wishing him the best. Uh, Yvonne Tortoise, he is a service. Wish her the best in retirement. Um, also, Kim Ferrin, who has since left and she's now in Florida. Uh, the workers worked hard. They did their job to the best of their ability, and they deserve a happy retirement. And as all people that, that work years like this, deserve that, uh, that time, which is uh, the golden years, so to speak. But uh, just a quick comment uh, to the new people in the front office, and I noticed I met a couple, uh, Nor, that's her first name, in the front office, I engaged with her. Uh, very pleasant person, uh, I, I really, and Gail, I really think the town manager picked a couple of uh, workers there, they're very personable to the public, and I think uh, looking forward to working with them. Um, I got a heads up reminder today, which I, I don't normally get, but uh, I really, I'm really optimistic about the new workers. It'll take a while for our new workers to catch up with our veterans. Here's, uh, in the front office, Kim, uh, Mrs. Ryan, and Tortoise were a threesome that just had so much experience on how to handle things. You just don't have that when you get the job. You uh, earn that over the years. And I, uh, again, to the experienced ones, congratulations and wish them the best in their retirement. Thank you. Very good. Councilor Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, I would also like to extend uh, well retirement wishes to Mr. Knoyer and uh, a special one to Ms. Tortoise. When I first was moving into town and getting adjusted, she was the person that helped me get adjusted and figure out salvage <clears> government. <throat> um, I can honestly say if it wasn't for her, I don't think I'd be here right now. She was so helpful in helping me understand and get all the information. She has been a real blessing to this community. And I, and I know this community is forever thankful for her years of service to this community. So thank you. Very good. Councilor Steves. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm out to echo what you just said there, Councilor Ryan, about Yvonne. Um, when I came in as a council, and especially when we were dealing with the previous manager. She was, she was a, a fountain of information and all that of stuff that helped, helped the town function um, when we really needed somebody that was running the show. Um, and 
I think that, uh, I hope that she and Kim have a wonderful time in Florida because she's going there too. But she, they, they hope that they send some of the warmth up here but not the mosquitoes. <laughs> Um, I also want to say thanks to Denise Clements and Yvonne and um, Pamela Duke for their work on the Charter Commission, um, or committee rather. And uh, when we get to doing that, there's going to be a whole bunch of hurry scanning through. There's a bunch of changes in there. They've done a lot of work on it. Um, so anyway, thank you to all of them and thanks to Will for his time and service. Uh, good, have a good retirement. I don't have anything else. Thanks. Very good. Councilor Catrona. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Nothing this evening. Very good. Councilor Marchetti. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I see that um, like this is about six months till the end of my thir first term, and there's some things that I hope that we can look at this upcoming year. Um, one of them is uh, we have a lot of road construction this year. It seems like uh, we need better oversight of the road construction. Uh, so I hope that we can do something about getting somebody who can oversee all the road constructions in town and make sure that things are done in a timely <coughs> manner and uh, in good quality work. Uh, I also hope that we can take a look at the curbside collection that'll be coming up. I know that you had mentioned it earlier. You, it kind of got past me there, so I wasn't sure what day you were planning that. But I think that it's something we need to really work on. Most of the residents in town that I talk to they want to keep curbside collection exactly how it is right now. So I would be in pushing for that as well. Um, also, uh, I, I understood that Holiday Vision was uh, a success. I'm sorry I couldn't make it. But uh, I'm glad to see the town you know, have some activities like that that are you know, something to do in town and something that that's, makes people you know, have a good time. And, uh, feel good about Southbridge. It looked, the pictures I saw on social media, they looked, it looked really uh, like they were really having a great time. Uh, and I also would like to uh, wish Yvonne Tortoise Godspeed in her retirement. Um, I worked, since I got on the town council, it was Yvonne Tortoise that I worked with her. I mean, I came in every Friday looking for my packet. Uh, she was very uh, patient with me, and uh, so I appreciate it. So. That's all I have, thank you. Very good, Councilor Jovan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First off, uh, Council Marchetti said he was finishing up in his first term, so was he announcing that he was running for re-election because it sounded like it? <laughs> um, which, is, which is good, I mean, well, <laughs> a lot of work on council. Um, a couple things, I know everybody thanked Yvonne Tortoise uh, and Kim in that office, but I, I really, I want to say thank you as well because serving as chairman of the council for three years, um, she was a valuable asset to me and helped me tremendously as chairman um, in getting agendas. And sometimes we had a little quirks but about agendas, but we did our best I can. So thank you and wish her and Nick, uh, you know, great retirement down there in Florida um, and have them enjoy themselves. And also thank her for her work on the Charter Commission. Uh, and it was mentioned uh, earlier, the Charter Commission with Pam. Uh, Denise, Yvonne, and Andrew Murch uh, for their hard work on the commission. As you know, I announced that for almost a year, maybe two years, that we needed to get that going. It was very hard getting uh, individuals to uh, volunteer to do that, so I thank them for stepping up and some of the changes that, just looking at it briefly, I look forward to the discussion on that. Um, holiday visions, to Council Marchetti's point, I had the opportunity to attend it with my grand, uh, grandson, uh, it was a great event. Uh, I think by all accounts, it was the most people that I think have been down there uh, and uh, since they started. So it was a great evening. It was nice to see the community out, especially after the, the two years that we've been going through. So thank you to all that participated in that and the leadership for that. Um, one thing, and I, I just don't know, we had a speaker and I, I, he has every right to speak at Citizens Forum. However, uh, and we've done our due diligence not to engage with speakers because they do have their opportunity um, to be heard. However, to the community, there's a lot more to the story. Um, and he threw out a lot of allegations that um, are not necessarily uh, are unfounded. Um, 
there were a lot of concerns on that, and I understand we've we've been passionate on both sides on that, and councils have been passionate. I'm not going to rehash it, but at some point, it has to be addressed that he has the opportunity to speak. But some of the things he's saying, and we don't engage at Citizens Forum, but at some point, I I, I think it's in, I don't know how to get that message across that um, we held a four and a half hour hearing the first time, then it was a violation, and we we all uh, disagree, but. Um, there was a lot of opportunities to be heard on that that case. So, to the citizens, I just want you to know there's more to the story. That we this council was was very compassionate the first time around. There was a lot of disagreements through councilors about how we were going to go even the first time, and we gave that individual um, the opportunity. Um, and for whatever reason, I'll just leave it at that. But to the citizens, there's more to the story. So don't think that this council wasn't compassionate because we were. Um, and that's all I have this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Vice Chair Adams. Thank you, Mr. Chair, through you. Um, so I, I want to thank the Charter Review Committee for all the hard work. Look forward to having that discussion at the Council of the Whole and uh, a good debate and, um, and review. Uh, so we really appreciate your time and effort in doing this. Uh, Ms. Tortoise, I, I wish you and your husband the best uh, heading, down to, heading down south uh, to a little warmer climate. And well deserved, and I appreciate your service. I, I did thank uh, Mr. Knoyer uh, earlier for his service to our community, and I wish all of them uh, that have left uh, the best in, in their uh, new future, new chapter in life. Uh, curbside, uh, just to re reiterate what uh, Councilor McKetty, it's going to be voted on on the 10th of January. Um, I'm working with the town manager to come up with the motions, um, and based on um, I believe what the committee had discussed and, and voted on as well. And then we'll go from there and this up to the committee. If, if any counselors or any residents uh, need further clarification on it, uh, give me a call um, and, and I'll definitely um, help it where I can. Um, holiday Visions, it was just a bit cold that day, but it was great to uh, see the community. Uh, it was a lot bigger than, than we've seen in the past. RMG, I. Uh, Renaissance Medical Group, I attended the third anniversary dinner uh, last month. It was a, a great success. Um, Senator Gomez uh, from Chicopee area, Springfield, I'm sorry, Springfield area was there to speak. Uh, Officer Rosa received their Hero Award um, and uh, it was a great overall event. And I found out that Senator Gomez, I, his father and I worked together in Springfield after I retired from the Marine Corps. And he's done a lot of great things for veterans services out in, in the Springfield area. And I think lastly, tomorrow marks the 80th anniversary of attack of Pearl Harbor. Um, you know, so uh, as, as history moves further away from us, uh, sometimes we forget, but we still have that part of that greatest, greatest generation that's still out there. Very few left over from the Pearl Harbor attack. I know when I taught at the University of Oklahoma, we'd have the, uh, those survivors from the USS Oklahoma there, and I don't believe there's uh, any, uh, any remaining service members left. And I just reiterate on uh, the VFW Post 6055, Leonid J. Lemire Post here in town is named after the Southbridge resident, uh, Leonid J. Lemire. Uh, he was on the fan tail of the USS West Virginia uh, during the attack. He was getting ready to head over to uh, the mainland uh, of Oahu uh, to, to go to church and when, when the first wave came through and he was killed instantly. So that's all I've got. Uh, the next meeting is December 20th at 7 p.m. here in the dais. Thank you. There being no further business, I'll take a motion to adjourn. No. Second. All those in favor? Unanimous, all present. <laughs>